Welcome everybody to the second day of the United Nations Satellite Activity Remote Sensing and Smart Tech for Marine Litter and Debris in the frame of the United Nations Ocean, Clean Ocean Laboratory. This session is a continuation of the session of uh, yesterday chaired by uh, Victor Martinez Vicente, which was about science and technologies capabilities. My name is Paolo Corradi and I work at the European Space Agency and I will be the session moderator of today. So, let me start with some uh, um, event rules. The event will be recorded, so be aware of this, and is now live in the YouTube uh, channel provided. So welcome also to all the participants uh, seeing us through YouTube. The microphone and the camera of the participant needs to be all the time off. So sorry about that, but that's uh, a matter of not creating too much confusion. And uh, uh, if you want to make question and please do so, any input, any comments, please use the Padlet link provided also in the registration email uh, that you receive. Uh, um, our um, event support will also pass in the chat room of Zoom. Let me remind you the goals that uh, we have for today, which are part of the general goals of the event. Um, the goals of this session, together with the session of yesterday, was to raise awareness about the state of the arts capabilities and, of course, also of the limitation of remote sensing. And when we say remote sensing, we would like to highlight this. We speak from uh, uh, ground platforms, so thinking, uh, as you see in the image here, boats, but also, for example, uh, you know, uh, bridge camera or, uh, or camera in ports uh, or on a pole over a delta of a river, for example. And of course, we talk about uh, aerial remote sensing, including drone, plane, to the extreme version of it, which is satellites. Uh, today, in particular, we'll uh, touch the first uh, uh, two slides, um, two presentations, sorry, um, the platforms of drones and planes. So you will see a uh, very interesting application and uh, potential services also based on this platform. The goal is again to align some of the users and stakeholders needs and expectation with what remote sensing technology can do now and possibly in the short and medium term as much as we can predict that evolution of technologies can go. And again, one of the goals is to collect uh, your comments, your input, your contribution to this effort that uh, a growing community is doing. So again, please use the Padlet, the link provided. I'm uh, very pleased to introduce the distinguished guests and speakers of today. We will have the first two presentation from uh, Konstantinos Topozelis from the University of the Region in Greece, and followed by Eduardo Silva from Inestec, uh, in Portugal. And following that, we will have uh, two recorded video messages from Nikolai Maximenko of the uh, University of the Y and Krista Marandino from Geomar, Germany. And to conclude, we will have uh, two contributions from Laia Romero from uh, uh, Lobelia Earth and Caleb Cruz from HealthRise Media. Um, 
So at this point, I would like uh, to uh, introduce uh, um, uh, the first of our speaker, which is uh, uh, Professor Costantino Topozeris, who is a, a professor in the Department of Marine Science at the University of the Aegean, and is leading the Marine Remote Sensing Group. So, Costas, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you so much, Paolo. Can you confirm that you see my... Yes, I can confirm. Yes. Please go okay. ahead anytime. Okay. I cannot see you, but it's okay. So, um, um, I am Costas Topuzelis. I'm assistant professor in the University of Aegea and Department of Marine Science. Thank you so much for uh, having me here. It's, uh, I'm very honored to be here. And also, I have to say that it is really nice that we have uh, all this nice community working uh, on the same problem, on the same subject, on uh, trying to, to find a solution for the marine litter uh, uh, in, in the world. So today I'm going to present you um, uh, two major projects that we run in the University of Aegean, uh, dealing with calibration and validation uh, data sets for marine litter de detection. One has to do with uh, um, large artificial targets that uh, we place on the sea surface in order to see them from satellites. It is called Plastic Litter Projects. And the second one, it's the Coastal Marine Litter Observatory. It's a, a new uh, platform system algorithm that um, can detect uh, very nicely marine litter using drone technology. So um, this, is, this is the overview of my presentation. I'm going to give you some um, information about the early stages of the plastic litter projects, and uh, I will explain to you a bit what we have done the last four years for uh, for that. And then I will go through the coastal marine litter observatory, and I will explain a bit uh, more how we can detect the litter accumulation in the coastal zones with uh, drone data, and uh, how the AI algorithms can help us in order to produce. Uh, data sets that can be used in general from the community. So um, I will start with the plastic litter projects. Uh, uh, actually, these uh, projects are designed in order to see if we can detect the plastic litter from space. And um, our scope uh, from the beginning was to explore the feasibility of uh, detecting the plastics using uh, artificial targets. And uh, using these uh, artificial targets, we would like to extract meaningful uh, spectral measurements uh, using uh, sediment two images, actually. But also later on, other satellites uh, came to the game and we tried also to analyze uh, their spectral uh, behavior. So in the end, we would like to see uh, if and how plastics uh, can be seen from sediment two satellite images, and um, if we are able to simulate the coarse pixel using uh, drone data and drone uh, images. Um, this is, these are the flyers from the plastic details projects. Now we are in the fourth year, and uh, the last uh, two years uh, we are very happy because we run a project that is funded by, from the European Space Agency. So as you can see, uh, as you will see in the, in the few slides, um, the project uh, has uh, begun uh, really big, and uh, now we're able to have uh, large targets on the sea surface. So in the beginning, in 2018, we decided uh, for, uh, with the students of the University of Aegean to create uh, three very large projects. They voted to the World Environment Day and the World Ocean Day. Uh, in June, and we created uh, 10 by 10 uh, targets and we put it in the, to, into the sea surface. Uh, these targets uh, were uh, in the same resolution as uh, Sentinel-2, and uh, the main idea there was to see uh, how we can see the plastic from space. Uh, also, we ran this campaign with uh, drone images. We had several uh, payloads on drones in order to see how the plastics can be seen from drone data set. Um, these are the first results that we had uh, that time, and uh, the first image that uh, can show how the plastics uh, can be seen from space, from Sentinel-2, and also from a planet scope uh, image. Simultaneously, we try to use the uh, 
drone data set and uh, to calculate the percentage coverage of the plastics that exist on the in the pixel uh, of sediment two and we came up with a conclusion that uh, more or less we need to have at least 35 percent of the plastic co of, of, the, of the pixel sorry covered by plastic in order to be seen in uh, sediment two image um, in the next year in 2019 we decided to go smaller so we created these small targets smaller targets and these tar uh, targets were modular, so we were able to put them together and create uh, different shapes. Uh, from these different shapes, we tried to find out how uh, how the targets alter uh, into the satellite images. Uh, however, I, we are not able to have so many data. Uh, we are not so lucky due to the cloud coverage and uh, due to the uh, surface of, uh, of the highways of the sea surface. Uh, we ran this project for two months, but uh, as you can see, they we didn't have so many data. Uh, next year in 2020, with the help of the European Space Agency, we decided to uh, try to, to, to go further and uh, create large targets that get be stay in the water for a long time. So we tried to have some experiments for that. And uh, we compare the real uh, plastic uh, that we can find into the sea surface with uh, uh, MS and uh, NHDP mesh. And we found out uh, that um, we are very close to the spectral signature of the two targets, uh, which is very nice because we could use this uh, white mesh in order to create even bigger uh, targets. So also, uh, at that time, we experiment with the different type of uh, 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 targets. So we had uh, an aquaculture gate type target, and we also had the biscuit type target. We put several uh, plastics on them, and we tried uh, different uh, ways to attach the plastics on the targets. Uh, also, in 2020, we tried uh, to create the idea of the large target. We would like to have a very large target that will cover at least one pixel. We want to do this because we want to use unspectral methods in order to uh, be able to detect the plastics. And for that reason, we'd like to have at least one pixel covered by uh, plastic. So we we decided that we'd like to have at least a target of 28 meters diameter. Uh, and that was quite um, difficult to do it. Uh, or in reality, we had an experiment in order to, 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 to deploy it on the sea. We find uh, some uh, really difficult uh, problems. However, we were able to overpass them and uh, to, um, to, to, to create this uh, large target. These are the images from 2020. Uh, we were not able to have so many, so we have only three uh, images that uh, have uh, plastics in them and uh, different types. And uh, we, we went through uh, several algorithms in order to do the detection and to see uh, the differences between the, the, the natural plastics, the, the real plastics, and the, the mess that we have decided to use. And uh, we arrived to 2021. This is uh, the, the last experiment that we run. And uh, you can see that we have very two very big targets on the sea surface. One is with the plastic mess that you saw before, and one is with the, with the wood. So another material that floats on the sea surface. Uh, and why would we want to do this? Because we want to differentiate the, the uh, materials from plastics from any other that exists on the sea surface. And that is nice because we have a mooring system. That mooring system is stable, stays there, and we can attach several uh, targets and we can uh, leave them there for, for a long time. Initially, the project was designed to have it for a month there and to have uh, at least um, uh, eight uh, data sets, eight uh, Sentinel-2 images. However, we're able to keep them for, for longer time. Here is a result for the, for, from the satellite uh, image from Sentinel-2. 
with the mesh target and uh, of the natural debris target so from, from the wooden target. You can see that it is easy to, to distinguish it in, even in the optical uh, spectrum. And uh, it is nice to see that we do have uh, at least one pixel fully covered by uh, plastic or from uh, other material. Um, it was not easy. Uh, we had several problems there. You can see the biofueling. We do have, we do had some problems with the wooden targets. Uh, and uh, for two days, uh, some of the target was sinked into the water because we removed um, these um, nice boys that we had in order to keep them on the, on the uh, surface. And uh, it was a bit um, not, uh, it, it was, uh, sorry to use the laser point, it was a bit, um, um, let's say, difficult to, to, to remove it. It was here with uh, the biofueling and then to have to, to take it uh, out. Um, and okay, we also managed to have a, a mixed target, which means that we have also the plastic mess and the wood beneath. Um, the plastic mesh. So we had the target like this one with plastics and uh, and uh, uh, wood. Uh, so we can uh, further explore the different spectral spectral signatures from this uh, target. In the end, we were very happy that we have uh, 22 days. 22 days. So we run more than uh, three, month, three months, we had four full months with Sedin and Drata drone data sets. We well, have 22 days with uh, Sedin 2 drone data and C2 measurements. Um, we run from end of May until the beginning of October. Uh, all these data sets are uh, open so anyone can see the experiment log file and can uh, download uh, the data and the images that we had from, from that time. And also, we do have a repository of uh, 18 and 19 data sets on Zenodo, and we are going very soon to have also the last one uh, repository from 22 to 21. Um, so these uh, data sets uh, are really, uh, we think that they are really, really good in order to, to run algorithms for the detection and to making uh, larger experiments uh, on the oceans about detecting the plastic. So here we can see that uh, several, uh, we have several publications. However, there are many groups around the globe that are working on this subject and we are very happy to, to give uh, these uh, data sets for calibration and validation purposes. Um, so actually, we after the some years of looking how satellites can detect the satellite the plastics, we have found some factors affecting the detection uh, of the plastics. Um, for sure, we have problems with sangling, with uh, bottom reflectance if they are close to the uh, shore. Uh, we do have some problems with the bidirectional reflection, as we, you saw very. Nicely yesterday, uh, we need to have very good uh, signal to noise ratio in order to do the detection. And finally, the atmospheric correction is very important. We always want to go further and uh, create um, a very good data sets, but also an algorithm that can detect the plastic. So for the future plants, uh, we plan to have some inflatable targets that they can stay for a long time and uh, use these targets in order to create larger um, artificial targets. And the, the, the main idea that we have that is that we could create large campaigns uh, into several uh, areas in the world in order to have uh, large plastics on the sea surface with the public involvement, with public awareness, and uh, this uh, information can be used for science scientists in order to uh, validate and calibrate uh, the algorithms that they create. Um, going further, the, as you can see, the, the plastic litter project, the PLP, started in 2018 and 2019 became really uh, big for us because we were trying to understand all the different um, uh, problems that exist for the marine litter detection. 
we show that there is not only the, on the sea surface, the issue of the marine litter, it's also on the shore. And that time we started working with the CMLO, with the Coastal Marine Litter Observatory, in order to, to detect the, the litters that exist on, on the beach. We had the experience from the um, uh, drone data for the, uh, on the sea surface from the plastic litter projects. And now we're in a position that we can uh, uh, offer to the community a service that uh, comes for uh, detecting the litters using uh, density. So we, we, we believe that uh, the marine litter density mapping is very important on the coastal area. We do this with using uh, RGB images as input data from drones. And um, that is very easy for anyone to collect the drone data. If it has a, a drone, we have developed a protocol for that. And um, what we have created is a system that can automatically report through an open geospatial portal. Um, this is quite uh, uh, important because uh, the input to the system is just uh, raw images and the, all the rest goes automatically uh, up to the reporting. This is quite important because can uh, support the EU measurements, the MSFT and the United Nations um, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So how the system works, actually, we have uh, drone data and from this uh, drone data, uh, we have uh, created a system that uh, can do tiling, so can cut the images in smaller pieces. And from these smaller pieces, later on, we train in a, a, an artificial intelligence algorithm in order to do the detection. Right now, we have uh, gone one step further and we don't tile the images, but we detect the actual uh, objects, the actual litters that are existing using, again, the AI system. And um, from point of view of what we want to detect, this is very important in order to, to, to know what we expect. We said that we'd like to have um, plastics that are at the least bigger than a cup of the bottle, so we decided that we'd like to have um, a, a ground uh, space distance of uh, 0.5 centimeters. So we have at least four pixels into our images in order to detect the plastics. And also we decided that we'll go to the seven uh, big categories of, uh, of uh, litter that exist. Um, so we went for, for, for these litters. And in the end, um, we were able to do the detection. Here is an example of the area that we cover uh, with the drone, uh, with the drones. This is the reality, and this is the, the image that we can have from the drone. And once we train an algorithm, then we can do the detection. This is the actual system. Uh, the actual system is quite nice. Anyone can uh, log in, then can upload the data, and then execute the algorithm. Once we have this, uh, the result, uh, automatically will take back uh, the reporting of the detection. And here you can see where we already have uh, these data sets in Greece. This is an increasing um, um, system. And we hope that very uh, soon we will have uh, covered the, the, the most uh, majority of the Greek uh, coastlines, which is quite uh, long. Um, some more information on the system. Once uh, the data are uploaded and checked, we can see the actual uh, drone images, we can play with them, we can see their uh, specifications. And uh, after that, we run the algorithm, we, we, we see the specific uh, part of images that contain marine litter. And if we go a bit uh, more, we start having these uh, accumulation maps. This is quite nice, very important, because later on we can uh, uh, compare uh, this, sorry, we can use this, uh, uh, these data sets for comparison with the satellite images. So the next step now is to use this one as an input for the training algorithms of uh, satellite images for doing the detection uh, on, on them. Um, and uh, this is another example. Now we have the points, the points of the actual litter in different categories. We have the confidence of the detection and uh, we can create this nice uh, accumulation maps of uh, the litter. And also 
we can um, define the different categories and we can just uh, count the litter that exists on, on a certain area. This is an example of the algorithm. Now we, this is in, in case study on, in Rhenia, it's in a, in a place uh, very close to Mykonos uh, uh, Island. We have uh, an image here and uh, you can see that we can find the different uh, plastics uh, quite nicely and we can separate it from other material, wood or uh, stones that exist in, in, in the area. This is another example within, in a complicated area. This is in island of Lesbos here, very close to the university. As you can see, there are many places uh, that uh, contain uh, many liters. And uh, here you can see that uh, the algorithm runs quite nicely and can detect uh, most of the uh, liter. Uh, this is uh, a video that uh, shows the um, uh, how the algorithm runs. It's quite um, impressive to see that we can count the litter and we can separate it then if, from uh, a video. And uh, later on, we can create this uh, accumulation uh, maps. Uh, so to conclude, the Coastal Marine Observatory, it's a, it's a very nice uh, data-driven platform. It has a quite impressive, let's say, technology using AI and also uh, has an analytics uh, uh, part, which is all very important in order to, to run uh, time series analysis. So in the end, it's a, it's a tool that uh, can uh, be used for a standardization of the data, for harmonization of the data, and uh, to use it in different areas. So it is important to have in mind the interoperability of the system, which is quite uh, nice. Um, this uh, system can work for the MSFT, for the uh, specific um, uh, goals that it has and uh, the detection of the D10C1, and also for the United States, for the sustainable development goal of 141B. Uh, so it can work in, in large scale and we think that can be used in order to uh, provide data to Emotnet and also to the global partnership of marine litter. Uh, this is the two main links that anyone can go and see a bit more of how the systems are working and can download data uh, or can play with uh, them. Thank you, I will end here. Thank you, Costas, very much. Great presentation, a lot of images of uh, impressive uh, target facilities that you have developed. I think uh, quite unique in the world, indeed. And uh, as far as I know, I've been uh, already serving the research of uh, different remote sensing uh, expert in uh, uh, validating their algorithm and in having a reference for, uh, um, for plastic in the sea. So thank you very much for that. Please remain with us until the end uh, of uh, the session, there will be the breakout. Uh, there will be question, there is already a question for you. Uh, so I, I hope uh, and please confirm that you will stay with us, otherwise I can open the Q&A now. No, no I, will, I will be with you the whole time. Excellent, so we postpone the question and uh, at this point, uh, let me also remind regarding question to use the Padlet. I saw people using the Q&A window, that's also fine, but we would like also, if you can, please use the Padlet. Um, we can pass to the next speaker. Thanks very much again to Costas. Uh, the next speaker will be Eduardo Silva. Eduardo is a coordinator of the Center for Robotic and uh, Autonomous System at Ines Tech in Portugal. And he's also a professor at the School of Engineering at the Porto Polytechnic Institute. Eduardo, uh, at any moment, you can take over and uh, share your presentation, please. Let's go. Maybe I'm out of the my camera is off, but um, let's go. We can see the, your presentation. 
uh, is not in presentation mode, it's still just PowerPoint uh, slide. Is I guess you can go or in view, or you should have, you know, the button down, bottom right. The people don't see? Uh, and no, I personally see only your presentation, but in uh, uh, PowerPoint mode and not presentation mode. So you, you just need to make it in presentation mode, please. And then we are also not hearing you very well at the moment. I have a problem in, in network now. I don't know. Okay, let's me. Can I start in the? Yes. Now, now you're back. Maybe you can try to share again. Let's see if. Um, the... No, I, I don't know why don't give me authorization to, to share my screen in this moment. Well, look at that. Because uh, we passed before and everything. Yes, but Zoom is let saying me, now that you have a network let me bandwidth. Try again. Uh, let me try again. Please. Let me try again. Let me try again. Uh, let me try again. And uh, now you, you see my screen? I think, uh, yes, now we see. And yeah, if you can, well, if you have problem to go to presentation mode, we we can see like it was before. It, now you have bandwidth low again. Don't worry, we have some minutes of margin, so this technical problem can happen. The problem is not to the. Uh, let's see. Let me. Let, I don't know why this. Look like you have a low bandwidth, according to Zoom. This happened, but okay, but don't allow me. Eduardo, uh, nothing. I yeah, yeah, maybe uh, Katarina. You can, uh, you can, you can send know. your presentation to to someone or me or Diana, and we can try to. Diana, run. Diana, can you can you run for me? Because until now, I do the experimentation and. Yes, uh, I, I will try to share Can you... the presentation. Yes, yes. Just one moment. Sorry for that, but I don't, I don't understand why it's happening. It's a problem that's uh, part of the, of the game of uh, this uh, uh, virtual telecom. So I think we'll fix any moment. We have anyway minutes, uh, some margin uh, in terms of time. So we can, uh, we can catch up. Sorry for uh, the people following. Uh, we are experiencing some problem. Apparently, there is a glitch in the bandwidth. We are all scattered, basically, all around the world. And uh, this problem uh, can happen. Uh, Paolo, maybe Costas can answer the question in the meantime. In the meantime, uh, yes. Uh, I didn't want just to start now, but uh, let's say let's say we can make uh, we can take a question for Costas in a moment. Costa, so there is a question. Um, he's saying thank you for your speech. In case of uh, marine litter composed of plastic and other components, how you can uh, detect the plastic? So how you can discriminate in the plastic item from non-plastic items? And also what about uh, microplastic? Uh, there is any algorithm specific for it? Okay, for microplastics, um, they are too small in order to detect it uh, using uh, spectral, uh, spectral information. So up to my knowledge, we are not able to do the detection directly on microplastics. We try to, do, to find the microplastics using other, um, uh, other phenomena, uh, let's say on sargassum or uh, on uh, floating materials. Uh, so we use proxies in order to, to, to go for the micro, micro litter. Uh, for the rest, for the discrimination, we use uh, mainly uh, different uh, spectral, uh, spectral signature for the discrimination. 
which means that we try to discriminate uh, the floating material with the plastics uh, using the wave bands of the satellite images and uh, their characteristics in the specific bands. Um, so there are several problems for that due to uh, atmospheric correction, due to the sampling, due to uh, other uh, interactions. And uh, this is the research of the last year, so from the whole community uh, trying to uh, find and uh, uh, consolidate a, a real good algorithm for doing the detection. The plastic litter projects uh, mainly used for the calibration and the validation of uh, these algorithms. Thank you, Costa. Thanks for the, your reply. Yeah, um, if you, uh, I see there are not. I see there's still problem. If there's still problem, we continue because there because is. Because I, I suppose you see. Okay. No, it's fine. I, th okay. I think you are already seeing the presentation. Yes, Costa. Thank yeah, you very much. Uh, we have other questions. We will uh, bring back to you during the breakout uh, session. So, uh, Eduardo Silva, please, uh, you can uh, try now to start. and pass the slides for me, okay? Yes, it's okay. We can see and we can hear you. Okay, okay. So, challenge you, we have um, the, the VFI ESA and also to try to de-risk some technology in IPEX spectral image, taking account our, our experience with the IPEX spectral image and we start to to, to work with, um, to, to try to identify with spectral image, the, 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 and we are starting to develop some technology inside of IPEX spectral image to, to, to detect remotely the, the, the marine litter. We have uh, one project uh, supported by ESA uh, with collaboration with the uh, IMAR dos Açores and also uh, air, air, air Atlantic, and to 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 understand if uh, if the impact spectral image is in this the, the, this type of the and we developed these campaigns in the. Eduardo, uh, sorry, we have some. Bay, this, uh, we have some problem with the audio. If there is anything you can do to improve, uh, is better if at the end of the presentation. We are, you're really breaking up a lot. Sorry, if there is anything you can Me, do, otherwise, sorry, if because if the condition. Try. Diana, do you think Diana, do you think you're able to? take over because Eduardo is uh, is breaking up a lot. Yes, yes, I, I will take over the presentation. So, uh, oh, sorry, Eduardo. Uh, let me just, uh, so. But in Brussels, in, in our building is not, maybe I have a problem, I don't know. Uh, because I'm in Brussels, not in Porto. And Eduardo, I'm sorry, but we cannot really hear you. Now you're extremely distant and breaking up. Okay. So go, 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 go. I will move forward on behalf of Eduardo. So um, uh, the work we have developed under the, a project that was called Spectrometer for Marine Litter, uh, financed by ESA. Uh, the idea was to uh, evaluate the, um, the state of the art solution for marine litter detection using remote sensing applications. So the idea was to uh, measure with different um, uh, uh, systems with a um, uh, UAV uh, drone and with air airplane um, and uh, using uh, 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 hyperspectral cameras uh, and see the the level of um, resolution that we can achieve in uh, plastic detection. Um, the 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 plastic uh, uh, detection. So the trials were taking in a storage, in an odd spot in Pin Bay, in Fayal. Uh, and uh, um, we, we have set uh, different types of targets uh, made with different type of plastics. 
the system that we had used were two uh, cameras, uh, a Spacetim FX10 that has a wavelength range from 400 up to 1000 nanometers and the iSpec S620 that goes to the infrared region for 970 up to uh, 2500 nanometers. So, and the system, of course, was equipped with a, a GPS, uh, of course, for uh, navigation. Um, we also did some uh, laboratory tests, uh, different kind of um, characterization of plastics uh, with different type of techniques in order to compare the type of uh, spectrums that we can achieve in this type of uh, technique. So gather the information from uh, leaves that is laser induced breakdown spectroscopy, uh, FTIR, uh, X-ray spectroscopy, and also Raman spectroscopy. For the same uh, sample, of course, the, the spectral information is different because the, the mechanisms that uh, this type of spectroscopic techniques uh, uh, works differently. Um, but the, it, the idea was to have a data set of uh, spectral information from different plastics. So regarding the, the, the trials uh, itself, so as I mentioned, we used a drone to equip with the cameras uh, that did uh, some um, uh, measurements, some flights over the targets. And we used the airplane that did the same uh, type of um, measurements. The, the system was mounted in the bottom of the, the airplane uh, in order to, to, to do the measurements. The, um, the campaigns were made uh, between altitudes from 600 meters up to 1,000 meters of altitude and in the case of the drone up to 50 meters. Uh, we uh, also did two different types of target configuration. So one uh, made with single plastics and we used ropes, um, uh, white plastic uh, and um, the, the, the orange plastic was the plastic uh, where, the, where the buoys were, are, are made, the type of plastic where buoys are made. And we did a single plastic and mixed plastic in order to see if we're able to, to do the detection. I don't know if you are able to see. So this is the image from um, the drone that goes over the, the target. And the image of the airplane also over the targets. So <laughs> the resolution is completely different, uh, as you can see, but it's possible to, to see uh, with naked eye. And uh, further, you, you will see that was able to also be detected by the system. So uh, after getting all this information, we proceed with some processing. Uh, so uh, the idea was to use different type of techniques of the, for the, the detection of the plastics. Uh, we have used the, the classification CNN 3T uh, and the, uh, some information standard information, all data was normalized to have a zero mean and the, the classes had the number of points used to balance the value of the class that was the least point. Um, and uh, we found out this interesting results. So it was able to have a, a good uh, match with an overall precision of 9% and, and in the other case with 84%. Um, we also have the results from the, the airplane uh, and uh, we have the ground truth information and then the predicted, so with a good match also. Uh, the same with other set of data. 
And uh, this is, is some um, spectral information relating uh, the same type of plastic. So the, the difference between uh, uh, the lab um, spectra, the, the same information acquired by the plane at 600 meters of altitude, and the same information uh, um, gathered by the drone at 20 meters of altitude. There are slightly changing changes regarding the, the, the values, the, the, the peak, but the overall image, it's quite similar, which is what was expected. Um, so uh, as a final remark of this work, in fact, it was possible to detect the marine litter concentrations uh, in water with hyperspectral imaging sensors. Uh, the customized hyperspectral imaging sensor was mounted in two different aerial platforms. Um, we were able to uh, um, uh, perform the campaigns um, without any problem and develop a, a, a processing system able to detect uh, effectively marine litter in water. Um, it is possible, so the study um, confirms that in fact it's possible to to detect um, marine litter from water, although it's quite difficult to detect different type of plastics. Um, as a future applications of this project, um, uh, we found out that uh, um, there is an European uh, uh, directive that. Uh, um, mentions that uh, the port and harbors should uh, detect and monitorize the level of marine litter in their vicinity. And uh, we see here a possible application of this work. So since we were successful in detect, in detect uh, plastics concentrations in water uh, with a, a airborne system, we found out this could be an interesting application. Uh, the ports needs uh, now, due to this directive, um, a better surveillance and tracking of marine litter. And we found this could be a, a quite interesting solution. Uh, so this is a conceptual image that um, gathers all the information that we can have with the airborne information, uh, also with fixed cameras that could be in the ports, in situ sensors uh, if needed uh, to collect uh, and to detect um, microplastics, and also, of course, the deep learning tools and techniques that can automatically detect and map uh, the, the level of plastic in the arbor. And I think it's, it's all. Thank you. Uh, Eduardo, Diana, thank you. Thank you very much. Very sorry for the little technical complication, but at the end, uh, we managed uh, to sort it out. So uh, thanks for the presentation and your result. And it uh, looks also you have uh, contributed uh, on a new platform that uh, at the moment is uh, uh, used only for from very few groups, uh, which is uh, airplane that they surely have a, a undisclosed potential yet because they're not explored enough. I can take a very quick question uh, to Diana. I know Eduardo also is, is going to leave, so I don't know if maybe you also will get uh, Eduardo back. But anyway, I made a question to both of you. Um, they're asking the size of the target. And uh, in case, uh, if you want to reply in Padlet, Diana, they also ask about the dates when they were deployed. But maybe you can just very quickly reply which was the size of their target, please. Yes, the size of the target, uh, I think it was three per three meters. So uh, it was the, 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 the feasible target to, to do in that place, um, three per three meters. Uh, regarding the, the deployment, this was made in September 2020. Uh, 2020, yes. So um, one year ago, roughly. Which may be to prevent uh, uh, the expectation of the audience. We can already say it was a cloudy day, if I remember well. 
Yes, yes. <laughs> so maybe people looking for a satellite uh, uh, coverage, maybe they will be disappointed so we can uh, prevent that. But yes, always uh, they can always try. Uh, Diana Eduardo, thank you very much. Uh, Diana, I, I know you will remain with us until the breakout session, so I'm sure there will be further question. Eduardo, thank you very much if you can hear us. Uh, uh, sorry again for the for the issue, but that we appreciated the contribution. No, I'm afraid we lost Eduardo. You lost Eduardo. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you, Diana. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we. Um, uh, we pass to the next uh, presenter. The next presenter is uh, uh, Nikolai Maximenko. We will have a video, a recorded message from uh, from Nikolai. Unfortunately, uh, um, it uh, works uh, against Nikolai Bots. The fact that he's uh, running a parallel event about uh, IMDOS, the Integrated Marine Debris Observing System, and he's also night because he's in Hawaii. Nikolai is a senior researcher at the International Pacific Research Center at the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at the University of Hawaii. And uh, his expertise span from observation to remote sensing and modeling of ocean circulation and its role in climate and ecosystem. I see we already have uh, the presentation uh, um, shared. So please, Katarina, at any moment, Everybody, I think we can- Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to contribute to your discussion, even though I was not able to join your live conversation. Um, as a supporter of uh, IMDOS, which spells as Integrated Marine Debris Observing System, I deeply appreciate the unique role that remote sensing, uh, together with models and in situ measurements, would play in, uh, in this comprehensive observing system that is supposed to take a um, uh, problem under, under control. You have all reason to be very proud of yourself. In recent years, you achieved a lot. Uh, there were several brilliant research projects that were funded through uh, governmental agencies and foundations. A number of fabulous scientific papers uh, is, is already large and increasing fast. Uh, rec recognition of your community effort as a task force within International Ocean Color Coordination Group it's, is remarkable. But I want to be cautious in my optimism because most of these studies were based on controlled experiments and they are kind of preparation for the future. Uh, also, I don't know yet, I don't have yet any satellite-based product that I could use, for example, in my model. In a graphical way, the maturity of observing system uh, depends on overlap between its components. And right now, in my view, remote sensing has little overlap with uh, in situ measurements and more. Two simple illustrations of my cautiousness. Uh, for example, in 2011, tsunami generated huge amount of debris, and at that time, satellites could not help us much. They uh, detected thick mats of debris right after tsunami, but a few weeks later, when debris dispersed, uh, it, it became invisible to satellites. Uh, in the meantime, it, it was washing up on North American and Hawaiian shorelines in large amounts. I'm asking, would we be able to see this tsunami debris today? I'm not sure. Another example is uh, last December, a huge cargo ship lost more than 1,800 containers, cargo, marine containers, and uh, um, presence of their, of their content was confirmed by uh, observers on northwestern Hawaiian islands and also by sailors going north of Hawaii. Fortunately, nothing, fortunately they uh, didn't reach uh, main Hawaiian islands, but we know uh, these containers were out there. And with the best effort, we were not able to see anything uh, through our satellites. Now, the hard part, why our satellites cannot see marine debris the way how we want it? There are many, many technical reasons, but combined together, I would say existing satellites were not built with marine debris in mind. 
they are mostly designed for targets on the land. What can we do to mitigate these limitations? First of all, I think we should be real. We should be realistic. Uh, we need to um, objectively evaluate capability of satellite missions and decide honestly what we can on, and what we cannot do uh, using, using their, their products. Then we can also check the entire line of um, processing of the information from uh, accuracy and, and um, precision of sensors to onboard processing and uh, on-ground quality control and um, product production. Um, as, as a last resort, we can also try to switch from uh, detecting small debris items to detecting larger ocean phenomena, such as windrows, leaks, and eddies. This will not solve all our problems, but it will help us with some of them. But speaking of a radical solution, let's think about designing and building a dedicated marine litter or marine debris satellite. Five years ago, I would not even say this, but now we are in, in a totally different situation when society is very concerned about marine pollution and governments and companies are ready to invest big money into, into this problem. Uh, additionally, commercial satellite companies are very active and they may be looking for new applications. Thank you very much and good luck with your uh, very important activity. Aloha. So our thanks uh, to Nikolai to share this uh, uh, very important message. Uh, it's, uh, it's a message, of course, of uh, um, what uh, are the limitations uh, nowadays uh, about satellites. Of course, as we anticipate the remote sensing, not about satellite, but we always emphasize this aspect because that's the ultimate tool we might have. And uh, it's very nice to see also Nikolai um, uh, looking to the future and to the possibility that indeed are presenting uh, closer and closer respect to when five years ago uh, this discussion was started and it was uh, uh, really a nice and simulating brainstorming, but we were not imagining probably to also arrive today at the point of uh, research and development that has been done so far. So that's for, for all of us very stimulating. And I thank you again, Nikolai. And I want to remember that Nikolai is uh, um, the initiator and the leader of the Integrated Marine Debris Observing System, where the approach of remote sensing is uh, an integral part, of course. So as one of the tool, of the many tools that we need to monitor marine litter. Remote sensing, we know it will not be the only solution, but it will be part of this integrated solution with the ground measurement up to satellites. Um, so again, thanks. Please, if you have any question for uh, uh, Nikolai also, he's not here uh, as you understood, but uh, you can leave it in the Padlet and we will try to pass to him and so to uh, get and publish a reply. Now we pass to the second uh, recorded uh, video of uh, today, a recorded message from uh, uh, Krista Marandino. Uh, Krista uh, is a researcher working at the Division uh, of Chemical Oceanography at the Helmut Center uh, of Ocean Research in Kiel in Germany. Krista does research in uh, analytical chemistry, in atmospheric chemistry and chemical oceanography. She's also leading the effort uh, of the OASIS, uh, which is Observing Air-Sea Interaction Strategy Group, uh, who is another United Nations satellite activity currently running in parallel. Uh, so uh, if you will have time, uh, once we are done, you can also uh, join and follow uh, their very interesting uh, um, contribution and, uh, and event. So, um, we should be able uh, now to uh, launch the video of Krista. I see now coming online. Observing air sea interaction strategy and our mutual interest in the clean ocean activities. I'm Krista Marinino, and I, along with Megan Cronin and Seb Swart, co chair the OASIS score working group that is taking a systems as a whole approach for making surface and boundary layer observations relevant to the Earth's energy, water, and biogeochemical cycles. OASIS was endorsed as a UN Decade program. 
and has teamed up with the Surface Ocean Lower Atmosphere Study, or SOLAS, to convene our satellite activity. To understand and predict the ocean's influence on weather and climate, we need to accurately resolve air-sea heat fluxes. The first step of developing the OASIS is determining what processes need to be observed, their sampling requirements, and uncertainty specifications. The color coding here shows what accuracy the fluxes must be to achieve a 20% signal-to-noise ratio. But we also know that heat fluxes are not the only air-sea flux that is critical to understand. Others include water, carbon dioxide, and other trace gases, such as N2O. Our working group has its roots in the Ocean Ops 19, the once-per-decade strategic planning conference. Megan, Megan was a lead author on a community white paper, Air Sea Fluxes with a Focus on Heat and Momentum, that had 29 co-authors from around the world. She saw other community white papers led by the carbon community, the weather community, the satellite communities, and by different regionally oriented communities like the Tropical Pacific Observing System 2020 project and the Southern Ocean Air Sea Flux community, among many others. There were more similarities than differences in the pitches. Most recommended enhancing existing observing networks to provide more co-located observations. Many recommended using new emerging technology like uncrewed surface vehicles to expand the coverage of the global network. Nearly all discussed the importance of capacity building and sharing, mentoring, training, and education. All recommended developing best practices and making data and products more findable, accessible, interoperable, interoperable, and reusable. To make any of this a reality, it was clear we needed to take a systems as a whole approach. This was the driving motivation for forming a SCORE working group. As one of our first actions, we wrote a successful proposal for OASIS to be endorsed as a UN Ocean Decade program. This is bottom-up science and the community coming together to make transformational changes to ocean science for sustainable development. One thing that is perhaps different than other SCORE working groups is that we have administrative help from the Consortium for Ocean Leadership to help with communications, including a website, Slack pages, newsletters, webinars, and teleconferences. Their support is coming through Ocean Ops activities. Regarding this clean ocean event, we all know Sorry. that the human footprint... Sabine, can you mute uh, your microphone, please? ...such as the open ocean. I show you here just a few examples of this. The spread of surface ozone pollution, the occurrence of harmful algal blooms, and the reach of the global shipping industry. These topics and many others have a key air-sea interaction component. This UN lab is a crucial but a relatively unique opportunity to allow the air-sea interaction community to reflect on how our traditional scientific topics interface with ocean pollution and hazards. To facilitate this process, we have convened the Oasis for Our Clean Ocean event with the aim to develop a roadmap for how observations and understanding of air-sea interactions can support a clean ocean. This clearly involves the satellite community. Our event has three sessions with associated main questions. The first session is on impacts of marine pollution. We ask here, what are the effects of pollution on air, sea, biogeochemical processes, harmful algal blooms, and other processes? Session two is about techniques in observing or understanding marine pollution. We ask here, what are the observational and model tools used to support a clean ocean? These observational to tools include remotely sensed as well as in situ observations. We also ask what is missing from this set of tools. In session three, we want to um, explore the idea of an OASIS strategy for a clean ocean. And for this, we ask what specific steps should the UN Ocean Decade OASIS program take to support a clean ocean? We hope to engage the community in discussion on these topics in order to develop a roadmap for OASIS, SOLAS, and other air-sea interaction interested folks to move forward. Input from the RSMLD and MDOS sister events is welcome and encouraged. Please watch the videos um, posted here um, from our event on YouTube. Here I make one final point to support the discussion um, on OASIS for a Clean Ocean. This is the OASIS organizational chart, showing how we seek to work with community members across five theme teams. 
Each of these themes, developing the network and model design, capacity building and sharing, UN Ocean Decade, the best practices and interoperability, and fair data model and OASIS products can be tapped to support a clean ocean, but we need engagement from the community to help us learn how. Please join our network at arcops.org and be part of this community effort. Thank you very much. Thank you to Krista, and uh, yes, it's the same uh, uh, said for Nikolai is valid. Please uh, put your question on the Padlet, also for Krista. Uh, indeed, I would like to highlight the fact that our event, the IMDOS event and the OASIS event were proposed and selected by the United Nations Clean Ocean Laboratory as a coordinated effort covering, in fact, the marine litter topic. So we, we, we count to continue this cooperation with the IMDOS and the OASIS for the future. So that's why you see uh, the intervention of uh, representative of uh, the IMDOS and OASIS group in uh, our event, as well representative uh, uh, of our event, like Manuel Arias was presenting in uh, their events. And, uh, and now I think we can uh, proceed with uh, the next uh, speaker. The next speaker is uh, Laia Romero. Laia is a... Uh, um, um, is a uh, ISAT SAT group uh, director of operation and uh, strategy. And uh, uh, she's also responsible for the health observation service business unit of uh, Lobelia Health. And uh, her work is focusing on satellite data for climate action. In the frame of our effort of uh, remote sensing of marine litter, Laia is particularly focusing on the microwave based uh, exploitation of uh, satellite images, in particular SAR combined with artificial intelligence. And uh, today uh, she will uh, introduce this and also an important initiative, which is about uh, developing a, a database, OceanScan, that might uh, be of great support for all the research. I see Laia is already connected. Uh, hello, Laia. Um, you can share at any moment your presentation. Yes. I can see it uh, and is uh, in the presentation mode, so anytime. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paolo. I have um, two parts of my presentation. The first one is on the use of SAR for marine litter detection, the work that we have done so far where we are, and the next steps. I will try to be very brief, and then I will I will present OceanScan, which is an in situ and remote sensing database for remote sensing um, studies of all like that apply to all of the presentations that we are seeing today and also yesterday on the development of new technologies for the detection, study, and analysis of uh, marine litter and debris. So the first uh, part of my presentation is on my personal uh, research field, so to say, which is on microwave and um, on the analysis that we have done so far. So, as you have seen, most of the projects and ongoing initiatives focus on optical uh, data. Well, we have already seen um, also thermal and and in the optical, there are many different technologies used, but there is little on microwave and our objective in a way, a few years ago when we started, uh, was to, to understand the sensitivity of the radar signal to the presence of, of marine litter. We started with plastic and we are now looking at uh, plastic and also uh, debris such as wood and and others. So um, the importance of this is that uh, SAR works in an all weather, night and day, uh, white swath, and it sees through clouds. So it is very, very useful and um, applicable to any, any maritime study, anything that we look on the ocean because of clouds and because everything on the ocean is moving. So by using SAR, in this case, a radar with other techniques, we can greatly um, increase the temporal coverage and the spatial coverage of any measurements that we do. 
So, oh, okay. So as I was saying, our objective was to demonstrate the potential of this technology and set up an automatic identification of marine litter in star images following a pixel-based approach and using AI. So for that, we have been facing in the last years um, three different lines of work. One is the generation of ground truth correlated to SAR acquisitions, because as we will see later, it is very difficult to have ground truth to set up any kind of studies, and we have seen it in other presentations these days. Also, to identify the SAR features that are well mapped with the presence of marine litter, and we are looking here at texture analysis, intensity, and polarimetry, and also to develop an expert pattern recognition approach to identify these marine litter signatures. So the preliminary, well, a bit on the methodology, so we are looking at patches of marine litter in the ocean and also in the same images at areas with no marine litter present. And we extract features and when we run a principal component analysis to see which of these features are, um, are explaining the largest percentage of the variability of a data set, in this case of the in-situ observations um, on the ocean. Just uh, as an overview of the methodology, we, I want to be very quick. And a preliminary, the preliminary results in the Balearic Islands, and I think Manuel actually mentioned a bit these this results yesterday, uh, were quite, um, quite positive. We have a good balance accuracy for, for a couple of, of methodology. A total of 1,794 pixels were labeled as plastic in that study, and over 6,000 were labeled as non-plastic. And these good results were obtained, but the reality is that these results are very um, adjusted to the observations that we had in the Balearic Islands, and that we cannot yet apply this anywhere else because we require a lot more of in situ observations to be able to test in many different conditions to also understand a signal to noise ratio um, analysis that we are having, etc. This is the Mireya project and you can find it online and there is more information online. We tested this model on different uh, events such as Euro news because it was a news on a, on a very large patch on a dam and we tested our classifier on this completely new data set that had not been part of the study and we were able to see very clearly well there is a lot of uh, noise in these images but it is exactly the same one in the in the first one and in the second one and what you see different is the actual detection of the litter that corresponds to the, um, the upper band in the blue, the blue lines and also the lower band in the red lines. So actually we see that the sensitivity uh, inside the marine litter that we demonstrated in the first study, it is actually applicable because the more that we check, the better that, that we see that it can perform. Um, some other ongoing work because the project uh, ended at the beginning of this year. And we are now working with GFZ and also GNR on the detection and tracking of large patches. So a bit building up on the processing chain that we have already built for the, for the SAR. We are using it. This is a patch in the coast of the Balearic Islands in Mallorca. And it is a patch that we detected that we only detected in SAR because uh, it was not visible in optical because of the clouds. It is a patch after a storm and we continued. We, we could see this patch moving in this area, in this area of, uh, of the Mediterranean. And we are studying how we can detect it and also track it with um, currents, with models of currents. And we are doing the SAR part and GFZ are doing the high resolution part with optical. Another ongoing work is the exploration of proxy features that lead to large accumulations in the radar signal. 
this is a work that we're doing with PML and the and the project is based is called frontal and it's is based on ocean fronts and what we are looking on our side is on the sensitivity of the radar signal to this type of discontinuities that we see you see here uh, some inflection points in the SSLA in the significant sea level anomaly of of sentinel 3 altimetry and how these correspond to some thermal fronts. In this case, they coincide very well, but it is not always the case. Thermal fronts that we see with other technologies and models, and because of clouds, we, we do not have the information on the thermal fronts um, everywhere, and so the radar can help. And so we are exploring also these proxy features. The next steps for us are clearly the increase in the training data set with more observations. We see the potential, we see as, some, as uh, our colleague was saying yesterday, it is not easy, but it is feasible to detect something, but then we need to know what it is exactly. And so with SAR, I feel that for what we know so far, it is a bit easier to classify different materials than with optical because we do not uh, rely so much on the optical um, conditions. So we would like to increase the training data set and we would like to test the potential of SAR for discriminating. For that, this is Topuzelis Costa's uh, experiment that he just presented. And so this type of artificial targets, the use of drones, the use of planes, like to build a larger data set is much needed to advance in this technology. So I will go to my next presentation, which is, um, on ocean scan and that tackles specifically the problem of not having enough um, enough training data, enough data sets. Wait a second. I hope I can share it. Okay. Can you see my presentation for ocean scan? Yes, we can see already. Okay, the thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, um, uh, Paolo, uh, thank you for having us presenting ocean scan in this session. Mm, ocean scan, it is a very special project because it is a community project. It is led by Lobelia in this case and Isaretsat with the participation of a partner, GFZ, a prototype, and the University of Versailles. But um, it is a project for the community that was born from the need of observations for the advancement in the remote sensing world. So um, let me, we started uh, this project a year ago and we will be having the online platform at the end of this, of this year. The objective of OceanScan is to provide tools for the community. This project will always be uh, open to, to researchers and free of use. And we are now building what it is, a marine debris database from Earth. So in situ, ground in situ observations of marine litter and debris and space with satellite missions. So we started with these critical requirements for, for uh, any given project on remote sensing. And these ones here correspond to our first project on SAR. And if you read them, they can be very similar probably to your own requirements for in situ data. We are talking to all of the teams that are working in remote sensing and marine litter, and we are collecting this type of requirements. So in this case, this is an example, but it is important because it is the starting point to have positive so presence of plastic and non-presence of plastic to know the extension of the plastic patches and to have like large accumul accumulations, not only like one plastic bag or one, you know, like this type of uh, databases are great for awareness and for many different things, but not for the remote sensing analysis. So we need large patches. We also need the error in geolocalization to be minimal. And this is very, very important because you cannot find like corresponding satellite imagery if the lat is not precise. Also the timestamp, every satellite mission 
uh, has an orbit or follows a track or the imagery um, has a particular timestamp. And we need to, to find this uh, matching Earth observation imagery and, and signal with the in-situ observations in the field to be able to validate, to calibrate, to understand what we are seeing from satellites. Uh, the number of samples. So for any AI, AI is blooming in this field and it is obvious, like the reasons why are obvious, but we need a, a large number of samples to be used in AI um, projects. The data should include some information about the total extension of the patch. The data should include the type of objects that are comprised in the patch, the type of material, the mean depth, of the objects, whether they are submerged or not. And I hope this sounds familiar to what we have been seeing in the last presentations and also yesterday. And finally, a picture. When we need a picture where we can discriminate what it is. So, because it is not even, if it's available in high resolution, yeah, but we need to be able to really say, this was marine litter of this type. And this is what we are looking at. Um, so we did a, um, we compared or we, we had a, a benchmark. We did a benchmark of all of the databases that existed. And we saw that there, there are many databases and we didn't want to make one more database. We wanted to use whatever existed that was useful for remote sensing. And we saw that many included super interesting information, but we're not compliant. None of the existing databases, these, these ones are the main ones, but, but there are more, the list, the benchmark is quite large, did not comply with the, with the needs of having land accumulations, but also water surface accumulations, surface accumulations, uh, precise geolocation, the observational timestamp, the data provenance, where they come from, so that we can actually credit uh, or work with other researchers that are taking these observations, and also the way of accessing these observations, which for AI um, projects need to be super easy, API-based or similar, to be able to, to build a data architecture. Uh, so what is OceanScan? It is a global in situ marine litter database that supports remote sensing research. It is interoperable uh, with other data standards, and this interoperability is shared with relevant initiatives, and we are building on top of UNEP, on top of OSPAR, on top of anything that exists so far, and we are looking at it at the task force, that, that we need to take into account, and it will be both ways. So what we produce in a standardized format will be interoperable for other, other databases. It is a well-curated marine litter data in a unified format. And it, the data sets are aggregated in what we call campaigns, and they have automatically an DOI associated to them and are stored in Zenodo. So to provide with full transparency of the data that is being ingested and to keep the full ownership. It is accessible via an API. It is an international cooperation effort. It includes a web interface, a mobile app, and a database. And there is a very strong code of conduct that I will mention. This is um, the mobile app. It is open source. It is a mobile app that is very easy to use and that um, follows the requirements that we mentioned at the beginning. So you take, you are at a certain place, you open the app, it works with Android and iOS, you take a picture. Once you take a picture, you decide uh, on a visual inspection level whether it's what type of litter it is, if it's one large single item, an accumulation, uh, um, a patch or a filament. Um, and you can take this picture from anywhere. And even if you don't have reception, once you have reception again, the GPS will, will keep the timestamp and also the geolocation of that picture. And this is automatically uploaded into the database. You can also put the type of items that you are seeing and also an expected, an estimated quantity. So 
a logic workflow, picture of observation, time lat long, visual inspection, literate type, estimated quantity, DB upload. This is from the app. Now we are working on the uploading from the web interface on existing data sets that, already, that we can already start using. The code of conduct, I will, this is available on the, uh, please uh, go to oceanscan.org and send us an email. This will be available. Everything is available on the, on the website. But the main idea is that it is open, that the ownership is kept, that the data provenance is always kept, that uh, the researchers can actually apply the terms of, ref, of um, use that most, that, that are, that are needed by their teams and that this is useful for everybody. And by sharing, we can actually all advance in this field. And then I would like to show you um, very briefly a demo of what's, what exists. Um, okay, I will share the screen. trying to be super fast. <laughs> um, okay. Do you see my screen? Yes, you start now. Okay, so this is in development. This is the development website. Uh, we can... We can log in. Uh, once we log in, well, this is the, the homepage. Uh, it's in development. Huh? You will see the places where you see the, where there is, where there are observations. We included a few, uh, that's the basis to test and to actually define the, the UX. And I want to look at the marine litter of which data, um, data set. We included this data set just for development purposes and integration. So the first thing that you see, I can also edit this. The first thing that you see is like the campaign, which is like the entire data set, what it the, the area that it covers and who are the participants and the area and the license and this type of things. And then when you go to data, uh you see hopefully okay <laughs> thanks a number of uh, observations that are inside of these of these data set and when you click on the on each observations what you see are the satellite missions that have tracks or images that are matching each of these observations you also see the material types because in this case, they are available, and um, you can click in any of these, um, and you will see all of the, of the tracks that are available. The participants in this case is Marine Little Watch, and you. I wanted also to show you the the filters that we are applying. So, which include ground truth images and by ground truth images it means that it is validated so that what these observations are of high quality are are like we should be confident on these observations that on the what we see on the on the visual inspection from these observations whether they are the single large item or if it is an artificial target, uh, if it has a small group of targets, if it is a patch, a filament, and the type of material to be able to filter. And so you will be also able to filter by a satellite mission. And that's it from our side. I hope that it was clear, more or less, and that I managed to convey the message. Sorry for taking so long. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, for introducing the microwave uh, remote sensing domain, Human Litter, and, uh, but also for your great effort and commitment to bring ahead something that uh, all researchers are looking for, which means uh, a database of ground truths, data, and images to work on.
So thanks for uh, the presentation, also the nice uh, website that you presented in details. Um, I hope the interest participant will respond also to your call and registering in OceanScan. You will find the, the link in the Padlet page. So please go there and also put your comment. Now we need to progress quickly. Uh, we have uh, our last, of course not least, uh, researcher um, and presenter is uh, Caleb Cruz. And uh, uh, it's big thank you, first of all, to Caleb, uh, who is uh, in California. So you can imagine what it means uh, presenting uh, in, the, in the night now for him. And um, let me introduce Caleb quickly. Um, Caleb is a researcher at the Earth Rise Media, focusing on uh, uh, artificial intelligence and remote sensing to better understand uh, environmental changes. And uh, prior to that, he was uh, studying uh, oceanography at uh, Stanford University. And uh, before leading the machine learning team at Leap Motion, focusing on computer vision system applied to virtual and augmented reality. And today, Caleb will uh, talk about detection and monitoring of uh, waste sites in uh, Southeast Asia using uh, Sentinel-2 data. So please, Caleb, uh, you, if you can share your presentation and start uh, at any moment. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Paolo. Um, yeah, so um, I'll be sharing some of the work that we've been doing. Um, uh, I would like to mention um, I'm with Earthrise Media, and um, this work has been supported by the Minderu Foundation. And I know that this uh, conference is focused on um, marine debris, um, but wanted to share uh, the work that we've been doing on terrestrial waste detection and showing some of the potential links to the ocean uh, debris problem. So first, what are we like looking into? What are we trying to find here? Well, here's an example on the right and the left of um, what these waste sites can look like. Um, on the left, you can see these sometimes astonishing aggregations of waste where it's just piling up in these huge mounds. Um, and on the right, we see sort of more of an informal site, more of a, maybe a, a dumping ground um, or something like that. And both of these are, are very important to be able to detect um, and ultimately uh, then monitor. Um, ideally, we wanna be able to do this in sort of a scalable way um, using remote sensing data uh, to be able to find these locations and um, so it's helpful to know what do these actually look like from space? Well, here's what they look like in high resolution data. Um, and there's you know, a very different story between high and low resolution, but it's helpful to understand um, at the beginning what it looks like in high res. So in each of these patches here, there's a dump site in the center. Um, so we've got you know, one here and um, one here, and you can see that you know, in high resolution imagery, they they somewhat have some defining characteristics. It seems like it might be a tractable problem to be able to find these things. Um, but then as we, um, so there they're highlighted the, the locations of these dump sites. Um, but then uh, when we move to uh, Sentinel data, we're using Sentinel data because this high resolution data, you know, it's not publicly available. And then also if it is available, um, it oftentimes is not refreshed very frequently. So we've been using Sentinel-2 data. And of course the product is uh, a lower resolution. Um, so instead of the 30 centimeter per pixel data that we were seeing before, now we're roughly sitting around 10 meters per pixel for the highest resolution bands. Um, and you can see that it becomes a really challenging problem to be able to identify the locations of these waste sites. So these are the same sites that we were looking at in the previous frame, but just seen through Sentinel. Um, so we're trying to make an algorithm that's able to identify these uh, waste sites and doing it in Sentinel data so that we can kind of have global coverage uh, and, and update that through time. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about our methods. Now, I don't wanna go too deep into the methods, um, but just a high level overview of sort of like, what's the architecture of this system and um, how does it work in practice? Fundamentally, um, we're, we're training neural networks to be able to classify the presence or absence of waste. And uh, with all uh, uh, applications of this nature and, and, and algorithms like this, you got to start with the data. So we start by selecting a um, set of known 
uh, waste sites. Now, uh, our data set is growing. We kind of turn an engine every time we detect new data sites that have been confirmed. We can add those back into the training set. But in the beginning, we started with only 10 known dump site locations, so a very small amount of data. So this is a kind of an example of what the positive class patches look like. Um, then we also collect a, a large negative class sampling, you know, uniformly across the region of interest, but also um, at a heavier density where the, the networks might be confused. Um, and then we, we train a neural network on this. Um, so what does the architecture of that network look like uh, roughly? Um, so the first step here, oh, let's see, there we go. So uh, the, the, what this looks like is we take each of those patches um, that you were seeing previously. And those patches, of course, have red, green, and blue uh, uh, wavelengths, but the Sentinel data stretches across 12 bands. So red, green, blue, and a, a number of infrared bands. Um, and we take that stack of information and we break it apart into each individual pixel. Uh, and we also look at that pixel across time to understand how it's changing. And for each of those uh, pixels, um, we then uh, pass uh, the single pixel to a, a pixel classifier. And this pixel classifier is mostly a spectral classifier to be able to evaluate the presence or absence of waste. And so the, out, the inputs of that are going to be a single pixel of Sentinel data, and the outputs are going to be a probability from zero to one that the uh, pixel contains waste. So here's how it works in, kind of in practice. On the left here, you can see an image of a, a pretty easy uh, dump site detection. You know, this one is fairly large and uh, situated within a, a forest. But you can see on the left, this is the, the, um, the waste site. And we break apart this patch into each of its individual pixels, pass those to the neural network, um, and then the neural network produces its outputs on the prediction of whether the waste is present or not. And so in this figure on the right, I'm representing any of the neural network outputs in blue when it says that there are no waste, and red when it thinks that there's a high likelihood that waste is present. And you can see it's pretty easy to rule out all the forest, right? Um, the network does a very good job of that, but it's also doing a good job of, you know, identifying that this, you know, bare earth or the road um, is not a, a waste site. So now that we have this pixel classifier that seems to be working fairly well, um, we can just deploy that at a pretty large scale. So here's an example of running the pixel classifier on every single pixel in Java. Um, and the outputs of that are it's sort of like a heat map of, of uh, waste presence. Now, I, I think it's important to note in this figure, this is roughly what those outputs look like from a heat map perspective but I've scaled this image um, so that we could actually see it. Um, if we didn't scale this image, we'd actually have more very like kind of little speckles where there's actual um, kind of these sites, the waste site uh, where waste is aggregated. Um, and so the outputs from that um, look like this. From the heat map, we detect um, areas where there's a lot of heat, kind of aggregations of it, and um, establish those as waste site candidate locations. So this all sounds great. Um, if the pixel classifier does a good job, it should, you know, be a good system. And so we were excited had run this on Bali and then ran it on Java. But then I started to see sort of a confounding result. So on the left here, you can see in these little blue dots, um, I was noticing that the pixel classifier was identifying lots of these white roofed buildings. And I was thinking like, come on, you know, I'd sample it in the negative class. And I was wondering what was going on and why it was detecting those. Um, and it was pretty confused until I looked at the Google Street View data and I noticed, oh, these are all plastic greenhouses. So the model probably is picking up a large signature of plastics. Um, and, um, and in this case, because it's a single pixel classifier, it has no ability to discern that this is actually a greenhouse versus a waste site. So clearly we need to bring in some structural information to sort of help this classification process where you're not just detecting a greenhouse roof because it's made out of plastic. Um, so we have one final neural network that takes every candidate site from the pixel classifier process that I described previously, takes in um, one of those uh, uh, candidate sites, generates a patch again around the candidate site. And in this case, it's uh, you know, taking in, in spectral information, temporal information, but it's also incorporating structural information. So it takes in the patch and it just makes a, a binary yes, no classification that 
this patch does or does not contain a website aggregation. And so for the previous example, it makes it very easy for the this uh, patch-based classifier to then say, no, this is a, a greenhouse. Um, it's clearly not a waste aggregation. So we have kind of this multi-layer uh, neural network system um, to be able to um, do these classifications. And so I wanna get into a little bit about um, what we're finding and, and the results so far. <clears throat> so we've run this model on all of Indonesia to this point, or this model system. Um, and it's amazing, like that's analyzing 163 billion pixels. Um, and we found uh, 330 confirmed waste sites. Um, and this is a significant improvement over what was previously known. Some, you know, data on this is always hard to come by. Maybe it's hidden away in some government database, but in terms of publicly available data sets, um, there's, you know, only 117 sites that are known of on OpenStreetMap. And even of those, a lot of those are either no longer active or, or not necessarily accurate. So it's amazing to be able to run this algorithm and say, in 2020, here's the 330 waste sites in Indonesia um, that we detected and um, are active. Um, I think that there's two interesting notes uh, to highlight here. One is you're analyzing 163 billion pixels to find 330 waste sites. So it just shows that like, it's, it's such a, it's a problem that's totally intractable to do um, by hand or with human uh, intervention directly. And so it's nice to be able to see these neural networks sort of pick up that task and be able to, at the very least, reduce the search space for the human um, uh, validation. And then on the second point about human validation um, and, and what these dump sites, these detections look like, I can say with confidence that every detection we have in Indonesia is an active dump site because we validated all of these by hand. Um, we look at high resolution satellite data or Google Street View data or you know, other, other sources to say, actually confirm whether this is or is not a dump site. Um, but um, I do know that we are still missing some. And so we hope the model gets better um, over time to be able to detect different types of dump sites. Um, but here, there are no false positives. Um, we realized this was working pretty well in Indonesia. And so we decided might as well just run it on all of Southeast Asia. So now we're analyzing uh, more than 500 billion pixels um, and we've detected uh, 918 waste sites across the um, countries of Southeast Asia so far. Um, and um, again, I think that the model will strongly improve uh, in geographies outside of Indonesia, we'll get much more sensitive to more dump sites um, as we add in a little bit of training data from this new detections. But it's pretty promising to be able to see that this model that was trained on data almost entirely from Bali and Java is able to expand throughout all of Indonesia as well as all of Southeast Asia. It'll be interesting. We're, we're going to try to scale the model to more and more geographies, um, but it'll be interesting to see how it does as, as the, the geographies get more um, more distinct from, from the Southeast Asia kind of uh, uh, type. So um, the next thing that I wanna talk a little bit about is um, we know the locations of these uh, waste sites. Um, and so the question is, can we do anything with it? Um, what, what else can we do that we ha uh, now that we have this data? So um, the first is uh, site monitoring and monitoring of the, the boundaries of the waste site. So here we run the pixel classifier for every single detected site, we run it again. And you can see, you know, you take in an input site like this, you make those predictions and you can find the area of the dump site that's actively has waste, not just like bare earth. And then you can build a contour around that. So that's interesting to understand the site footprint at a single point in time. But the beauty of Sentinel is we have data that stretches all the way back to 2016. And so we're able to run this pixel classifier um, across all of the scenes of Sentinel data. We, we actually are running it on a quarterly basis now and uh, see how that site footprint has changed through time. So here in this uh, figure, it's hard to see because you know, it's so small, but roughly the trend is where in red are the pixel classifier outputs that um, are high likelihood of waste. And you can see between 2019 and 2020, 
um, the, uh, the size of this uh, patch has increased pretty substantially. And so this is what it looks like in practice. You can see, oh, the way sites have, uh, this, this single uh, site has increased in size by 500% since 2019. And then specifically, you can see that actually how is it expanding? Like which direction is it expanding? And here, I think it's really interesting. You can see that the way site is expanding, uh, but in particular, it's expanding towards a river right along, along the left side of the dump site. And that river is very close to the ocean and you have to say like, hey, this might be a real risk for there to be a lot of leakage from this waste site. So that's uh, one element of um, additional uh, things that we can do with after we've detected the sites. The other thing is we can pull a lot of really interesting rich metadata from other sources um, to capture a more uh, uh, detailed picture of the site. So we can um, uh, query them based on their size. You want to only look at big ones, small ones, um, the change in their footprint, um, the land slope, the soil type. But in particular, one that's quite interesting to me right now, and I think will be functionally very useful, is the distance to a waterway. So if you think about Southeast Asia, there, there are just waterways all over. There, there's, you know, if you throw a dart at Indonesia, you're likely to land pretty close to a waterway. And we, we see this in the distribution of dump sites as well. Um, the, the majority of dump sites are falling within 100 meters of a waterway. Um, and I think that this could be a really interesting source of um, ocean pollution that is worthy of study. And I just want to walk you through just a couple of examples of this. Like we're seeing a lot of uh, waste sites like this. And the examples I'm going to show you here are all just taken from Java. Like these sites exist throughout Southeast Asia. But clearly you can see how the waste sites here are just essentially they're spilling over um, into the rivers. Um, and, and you have to think that this, this is a, a, a source of um, some, some portion of the ocean, ocean pollution that we're actually seeing and trying to monitor. You know, again, here's another example, and you can almost just like envision like the monsoon season comes, the river flows and it takes away the trash um, and, and flows directly into the river. And so it's really interesting that when you like analyze 500 billion pixels to find 900 sites, you then might be able to filter that down and say like, these are like the 17 or 20 sites that are um, kind of the biggest offenders. Like these are the ones to focus on. Um, if you're going to try to do remediation or um, kind of barrier enforcement efforts, then these are the sites that we think would have the greatest difference, make the greatest difference uh, for the ocean pollution uh, type of a problem. So this is just a handful of examples. These kinds of sites are, are everywhere throughout uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to share is um, uh, we're working to make this publicly accessible. Um, we want this to be a platform that um, where the data is open and usable. Um, and I'll just show you, this is what we have in development right now, um, where you'll be able to not only you'll evaluate the detections and be able to take a look at um, uh, the, the sites that have been identified. Um, you'll be able to uh, view how they're changing over time interactively to be able to um, understand how a single site is changing. Um, you'll be able to query the distance to a waterway um, for the site. Um, and then finally, uh, to be able to surface those other, um, other uh, site attributes. So um, that in a nutshell is, is sort of what we're working on on the, on the waste site detections on, on land and, and hopefully pairing that more with um, the ocean debris uh, issues. Um, I'd like to, yeah, um, uh, feel free to reach out with any questions on the work. Um, my email is listed here, as well as Fabian Laurier at the Mindrew Foundation. Um, feel free to reach out to us with any questions, and um, thanks for having me today. Caleb, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. I think there is definitely a continuum in monitoring uh, uh, for plastic waste on land close to water bodies and uh, water bodies like the sea. So, seems to me that for the big picture, we will need to combine or let's say fuse data from these two monitoring targets. So that's, I think is a very important contribution. Thank you very much, Caleb. And uh, please, uh, if you can also remain with us, uh, of course, like uh, with other speakers, we are opening now the breakout session. We are running a bit in late, but we have about 15 minutes to take uh, <clears throat> some of the question from the participants. I would like to start uh, uh, in the order of the speaker. Uh, from the Q&A window, uh, we have uh, uh, some uh, question from uh, Maurice Muller. 
uh, is asking if you are aware of any hyperspectral camera system small enough to be put on the consumer drone like the Phantom 4 or similar. Uh, or do they only exist for larger drones such as Matrix 300? So maybe I can ask this to uh, Costas and uh, Diana, for example. Costas, maybe you want to reply for this? You can start, please. Yes. Um, as far as I know, there is no hyperspectral camera that can be uh, used with uh, Phantom or uh, this type of uh, drones. We need to have larger ones in order to carry them. And um, this is because the hyperspectral cameras right now are quite big and uh, because they need to uh, derive uh, many wave bands, which means that uh, they need to be quite large. Up to now, I know that there is commercial cameras with eight bands, but uh, we're far away from having, let's say, 100. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think there is also another question uh, that could be still uh, for, uh, I think it's for, for you, Costas, again. Um, uh, what well, is uh, uh, regarding, the, isn't the objective to distinguish plastic from seaweed? Why you didn't include the seaweed on a test patch? So I think it referred to the target. So maybe you can elaborate on, about integrating yeah, yeah. seaweed. Uh, that would be actually nice to have uh, seaweed and uh, put it in a large target. Uh, it is something that we can do. However, we need to have a large amount of uh, seaweed in order to put it on the target and it has to stay there for a long time. Uh, there are some, let's say, difficulties in order to do it, but it is a possibility, yes. So in the beginning, we started with only plastic. Now we know that we need to have um, many other floating materials, let's put it this way, that they are natural. One of those, it was wood because it is easy to stay on the surface. Um, and then we can go to other ones like seaweeds. Uh, I have to say that even the goods due to uh, biofooling, in the end, it was hard to keep them on the sea surface for uh, two months. Yes. Can you imagine how much uh, can be more difficult uh, and I think for the audience to, to handle things uh, in the sea and uh, an experimental level. Uh, so thank you, Costas. I think we can also ask uh, um, uh, another question now to uh, maybe Diana and Hugo, I see is also there. Um, I think they were referring to your presentation, I'm not sure, but anyway, in, they say in practice, it is possible that the plastic is scattered rather than patched together. So how would this technique handle the result if the same amount of plastic used in the test were scattered and not like, you know, accumulated in the target? So what do you think? Yeah, if you can elaborate please about, uh, uh, you know, uh, very dense continuum plastic target or scattered, so dispersed plastic items. Yes, uh, regarding our, our experiment. Uh, Hugo, we cannot, we are very, very far, sorry. Sorry, oh, sorry. I was saying that regarding our experiment with the product, the still, still not good. <laughs> Better now? Better, yes. Okay. What I was saying that in our experiments in the source, the plastic was not if you compare, for example, with Costa's uh, targets, the targets, the targets are more dense than ours. So the plastic was not completely Connected, so there was, it was a dense mass because the targets was, were big, were 10 by 10 meters. But the, there were a little bit uh, scattered, a little bit in terms of the connection between the, the bottles and between each of, of the elements, so to speak. So you have water in, in, in between, in between the plastic targets. So, but the algorithms, the algorithms might, might be, we were able to images to be able to train the, the algorithms for the detection. And therefore, the, the, the algorithm was trained also based on that, and also based on what was water and what was, was the plastic target. So the idea, when we then extrapolate for the detection, is that he's able to detect on those conditions that was the training. So I would say that if the, the plastic is scattered, even so he's able to classify the, the, the plastic, I would expect him to have less precision and less recall in the detection. Okay, thank you. Uh, I 
I hope everybody could understand. They were breaking up a bit, but I think was uh, hearable, at least was for me. Thank you, Hugo, for, uh, and Diana, for uh, your uh, reply to the question. I would pass now to some question from the Padlet. Uh, I see um, a question from uh, Laia, for Laia, sorry. Uh, what is your opinion, Laia, on synthetic uh, marine litter data made from in situ verified data? Um, I was just answering in the in the Padlet, <laughs> yeah, I see, I see um, and I was commenting on on the use of artificial targets. But um, the question was on artificially generated by algorithms. We have not tested that. It would be it would be very interesting to actually test. So if this is from someone that has a data set that we can test, we can actually proceed and and see. What, what is a, an artificially generated in situ data set? Yes, it's not indeed super clear to me as well, but I think they are mean, meaning indeed the synthetic uh, accumulation done with the uh, in situ uh, verified spectral, uh, spectral uh, uh, you know, contents that you can inject in the synthetic, uh, uh, for example, uh, patches accumulation, uh, windrows, fronts. That's what I think. Hmm. It's, so you, you think this could be also interesting for uh, ocean scan I, in order? I think uh, it can be interesting for ocean scan, but we need to apply a validation criteria or a confirmation criteria. Like we need to be very clear on how confident we can be of a certain measure. So. Okay. It is yeah. it is a matter of validating and the and performance and metrics like to 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 be able to yeah to be confident on that measurement in one way. Indeed, the question. Oh, sorry, like indeed the question is about uh, uh, not artificial targets. They, they replied, but the synthetic data. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think indeed. Uh, um, if this data, as you say, if these data are somehow uh, based on a verified uh, uh, ground truths and uh, maybe composed in order to make a large data set, they could still be interesting in order to launch artificial intelligence or even deep learning algorithm, uh, as long as we don't have enough gather in your database. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Laia. You, you want to add something, sorry. No, 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 it's okay. That I agree with, the, with your comments. Um, so I would, there is a question to Caleb. Um, I'm reading now. Uh, I watched the, your presentation regarding dump site detection. Um, and I was wondering whether it would be possible to apply your algorithm for other areas across the globe. So Brazil, India, et cetera. What would take to apply it for those countries? Yeah, it's a very good question and, and one that um, I'm also curious about the answer to as well. So we plan to expand the uh, coverage of this algorithm. Um, and so far, we um, the model shows a lot of promise to detect consistent forms of sort of open waste. Um, uh, but what always is the biggest challenge in expanding to new geographies is, is mostly in the negative class. If you think about it, you know, we're detecting about one pixel in every 10 million or so is a waste site pixel. Um, and so uh, uh, when we expand to new geographies, we're always, uh, the model always gets confused by like some new weird thing that it's never seen before. Um, and oftentimes the way that that goes is we run a model on new geographies, evaluate the outputs, sample by hand in these classes that um, are sort of confounding for the model. And then the model generally kind of overall improves. So I think that um, it has a lot of potential to run in different countries. And Southeast Asia overall was sort of our first uh, step in that direction by running a model that was trained just on Indonesia specific data on broader Southeast Asia. Um, so I'm excited to be able to expand it in the future. So in short, we're planning to expand it um, to run uh, in new regions. And um, so far the model has done, shown to be pretty, it has the capacity to handle new regions, but um, always helps with uh, additional training data. Great, thanks uh, Caleb for the reply. There is also an additional uh, question for the same person, Philippe uh, from uh, Brazil indeed. 
what are the requirements for applying your algorithm? Is the code open and shared at some repository like GitHub? It's not shared yet, but we do want to soon. Um, uh, most of the reason it's not shared yet is because, uh, you know, as with any research code base, it needs to be a little bit cleaned up before uh, uh, letting other people in. Um, but it's definitely the plan to be able to open source the code um, when we release that platform that I talked about at the end of uh, the, the talk. And that should be kind of uh, in the first half of next year or this coming year. Yeah, that's great. Excellent. I think there would be probably a lot to speak more, but unfortunately, we are at the end of our session, so we will uh, need uh, to conclude uh, right now. And uh, we have one minute left, so let me uh, take the chance, of course, to thank very much all of our distinguished speakers today for the important contribution to the session and in the field of remote sensing of marine data. I would like to thank also the organizing team. There are several people behind uh, the event, and in particular, the Air Center that provided the great technical support towards the session. Special thanks go to Katarina, who is behind the control room managing from Zoom to the chats to YouTube uh, live streaming. So thanks, Katarina. And of course, I would like to thank you all of you that join and follow the session here and from the YouTube uh, streaming channel. Before closing the session, I'm pleased to invite you to join uh, our uh, last part of the event, the part three, today at uh, 1700 uh, Central European time. We will present a preliminary summary of the outcomes and of the three session. And uh, we will conclude the event with also preliminary uh, guidelines uh, for the next steps and initiative. So I look forward very much to see you in about two hours. Thank you again and have a nice evening and a nice weekend. Goodbye, everybody.
is already recording and I was Hello, Katerina. Hi.
Good afternoon, everybody. We are back here for discussing the session three of our event, uh, summary of outputs and uh, uh, guidelines. We have uh, prepared uh, among uh, the, uh, the first uh, session of today, and now uh, a quick uh, uh, sum up of uh, all the three uh, sub parts of our event from yesterday and today. So allow me to go through this uh, uh, draft uh, presentation. Uh, this uh, last part will be uh, more or less an open discussion where uh, uh, the speaker that uh, join and uh, the audience can uh, contribute uh, in trying to define preliminary uh, draft of the conclusion and the next steps and the guidelines for the community on remote sensing of Marilita. So allow me to make a quick sum up of the goals of uh, our event of these last two days. We have covered a part one about the users and stakeholders needs and expectation in terms of monitoring uh, uh, marine litter and plastic, uh, marine plastic in particular, and for which application or services envisioned by these user and stakeholders. Part two, which was uh, yesterday, uh, uh, later afternoon and uh, this early afternoon uh, uh, European time, we try to inform you about the state of the art capabilities and the limitation at the same time that the remote sensing tools, uh, meaning uh, from uh, ground cameras to drones, planes and satellites have in supporting the monitoring and the management of the issue of marine litter. And finally, <clears throat> we are now at the part three. Part three is trying to, uh, let's say, align uh, some of the um, users and stakeholders needs and uh, requirements and expectation with what is the current capability of the remote sensing tool and uh, uh, both yeah, now and uh, uh, in the short and medium term. And finally, we would like to conclude by uh, gathering in an open discussion, um, the, which are the next steps uh, to match the uh, technology capabilities required by the expectation and uh, needs of the uh, stakeholders and users. And of course, we would like to define some basic guidelines. Of course, it's not possible to define in a, such a short event and short discussion and preparation uh, guidelines for the next uh, decade. But this is something, this is a, should be seen like a seed of the discussion that we will have in the uh, months and years to come. So please try also to contribute on that. And uh, you have uh, um, received the, the link for the Padlet for the part three in the email when you register. So please use that one. And uh, we will try to monitor that uh, in order to uh, integrate uh, your comments, suggestions, inputs in our discussion. And of course, the, the vision, the, the, the ultimate vision that we have of this uh, path that we start also with your contribution today is to uh, work under a, a mandate possibly of a United Nations Decadal Action in the frame of the Ocean Decade for Sustainable Development. So let me um, introduce and make a quick uh, uh, summary of the users and stakeholders that we involved uh, in the part one. We had a quite uh, diverse uh, pool of uh, stakeholders also intervening from the audience. We had uh, defined here the main categories. So uh, we had policymaking and govern governance, users and stakeholders, uh, both from the international scale, so we can think about the United Nations itself, to regional scale, like program uh, from the United Nations ESCA program or from uh, EU, Euro European Union um, uh, programs and, and agencies, uh, European Space Agency, for example to national scale like uh, country governments and local scale. For example, we had the contribution from uh, port uh, authorities. Um, and other users is a monitoring agency. Uh, so like environmental monitoring agencies and uh, scientists, of course, these are users of the data generated for you know, uh, model, modeling prediction and uh, et cetera, like the transport modeling itself. And uh, of course, industry, private companies, this can be a very important element to add to the discussion and uh, to boost uh, the technology 
push to boost services to boost the business application and of course finally a very important element is uh, uh, sorry a very important uh, users and stakeholders is also the citizen so uh, also uh, there will be people among you that can contribute because at the end you want to know what is the situation of the pollution and you want to contribute to that as much as possible not only by following policies and regulation but also being proactive in trying to limit that so some collection of uh, uh, expectation and needs uh, from uh, uh, the part one. Um, we have, uh, uh, for example, uh, data for monitoring and assessing uh, effectiveness of mitigation measurements. This is something that encompass basically, uh, I would say, uh, most of the users. The need for mapping capabilities with potential layering of information with other variables and parameters like uh, population density, uh, the mismanagement of the waste uh, uh, according to the area, uh, known sources of uh, pollution and waste, etc. Uh, we have uh, um, the expectation to be able to detect and identify uh, litter hotspot and accumulation zones, of course. Uh, so not only the single uh, element single plastic item that can be done with certain platform but also hotspot and accumulation zone for example floating in the, in the sea in the coastal waters or even in the ocean uh, identify the location quantification and identification of uh, polymers types so certain application would like to have the discrimination of the polymers uh, the request of generating uh, data time series uh, and the baselines against uh, which the time series want to be compared. Feeding numerical models and support the validation and assessment uh, efforts uh, for, uh, via uh, modeling, computer modeling, so like transport modeling. Uh, and uh, finally, the one, sorry, that's not finally, that's the first slide uh, of uh, the expectation it needs. But one of those was uh, the request that uh, remote sensing data should be uh, fused should should be harmonized and integrated with existing in situ data so in situ ground data in a way that remote sensing data can be so directly injected into uh, what is already existing in terms of monitoring services and application on the ground uh, other uh, expectation and needs uh, that we collected from the users and stakeholders is uh, the uh, the need of standardize uh, of uh, the collected data for a seamless, comparable, and interoperable usage of those. So we want data that are collected and uh, and and presented and possibly published in a way that follows certain standards. So every groups can take this data in a way that does not need reprocessing or reconversion and everything. Everything is under the same standard and shared. Uh, more benchmarking about technology and data for having a comparison. Uh, some uh, user ask for the identification of a steady litter deposit in coastal areas. Uh, we have seen, uh, for example, a presentation of, of uh, Caleb about uh, uh, detecting um, uh, dam site, uh, so waste area, legal or illegal, that could contribute to track sources where the marine litter to be waste is uh, also generated for a large part. Um, there is a need of synergy and fusion of data from uh, different remote sensing sources. So again, <clears throat> again sometimes uh, uh, we identify remote sensing only with satellites, but uh, we want to stress the concept that remote sensing is not only satellite, but is uh, drones, is uh, uh, planes, uh, is a different kind of platform with different kind of sensor. And this should be, uh, should work together and integrate the uh, data um, generated and fuse them to try to find meaning out of them in time and in space. Um, of course, satellites are seen uh, by, by the stakeholders as, uh, as, a, as a preferred ultimate tool for uh, the overall littering problems uh, because of course of their capability to cover vast area from the ocean to even the land. But of course, drones uh, and uh, small, uh, say lower altitude platform are perceived uh, at the moment as more suitable for a local application. For example, like we have seen for uh, 
uh, the port uh, application for a warning uh, uh, services for the navigation or the cleaning of the port itself. So this is our first overview about uh, uh, the expectation and the needs that we were able to collect uh, from uh, uh, these past two days. And on top of that, we already discussed uh, um, potential services, services also seen as a potential uh, commercial application or business application. Um, one of the most general uh, potential service would be of course to uh, merge GIS information with the data points of money litter and their sources in order to uh, have a view, uh, follow the time evolution of uh, the waste pollution in the sea, in the rivers, and of course, also, as we discussed, uh, on the land close to water bodies. In this way, to try to better manage the waste and uh, to extract plastic litter, let's call them indicators or descriptors that can be relevant for decision making at many different level of stakeholders, like policymakers and authority, industrial entities, eh, in terms also of corporate responsibility of uh, uh, companies for their, their own pollution contribution, and of course, finally, citizen alike. Um, <clears throat> one of the services that came out was, for example, like I was uh, already anticipating, was uh, for port authorities. So warning to navigation on accumulation of debris that can damage, for example, the propeller. Think about uh, lost derelict fishing net, the so-called ghost net, but also accumulation of, uh, of uh, litter mixed with algae that could indeed impact uh, the navigation. And of course, simply for keeping uh, the area where the boats are, where the boats had to lead in a, in a cleaning state. We have seen uh, from uh, uh, Aqualit, for example, there was uh, uh, the mentioning the, uh, the need of uh, uh, and the potential service in detecting the, uh, pl the plastic littering result from uh, marine farming and aquaculture. So to monitor the contribution of the pollution, which reminds of the first ballot about, uh, uh, let's say, corporate responsibility about their own uh, generated pollution. Uh, we mentioned the possibility to have, uh, in terms of services, uh, uh, the generation of certification for plastic-free areas uh, where, for example, uh, seafood is collected. And we see food including uh, from fishes, uh, mussel, uh, uh, farming, and aquaculture, but even we saw uh, from uh, Vito Verdeglio in the, in, the, in the first day, the sargassum, which are used, that they have potential use on land uh, in many, uh, in different fields. Uh, and finally, of course, there is education. So uh, the potential service would be to provide local development plans, including educational elements. Uh, regarding the part two, um, we have, uh, uh, we have assessed technology capability and R&D uh, at different level for different uh, uh, also application in that case. And here we have uh, tried to structure uh, uh, the discussion per platform. It's very difficult to try to encompass and, uh, and uh, summarize uh, all the technology capability. As you can imagine, this depends on the, type, the kind of sensor, on what you indeed want to see, et cetera. So we tried to uh, summarize first in terms of uh, platform. So let's say the level of remote monitoring uh, we can have. Starting from, uh, well, platform that are at the ground, at the surface, we still have remote sensing sensors, uh, but uh, we are on the ground. So for example, cameras uh, installed on bridges or in uh, arbor, uh, platform that can see uh, the full arbor, like the lighthouse, or on the beaches, or on boats itself. And in general, also, sorry, not in general, but also specifically could be even on uh, uh, um, maritime autonomous platforms. So in this case, we can have ad hoc sensors, eh, uh, dedicated, highly performing because they are on the ground, they can be accessed, they can be maintained, and uh, um, you can detect plastic litter uh, with, uh, with the already uh, application uh, successful on that. For example, let me make uh, this uh, application example. Uh, there are already several applications uh, able to detect the plastic items and identify as such. 
that flows under bridges in uh, rivers uh, in a different part of the world already. With drones, drones uh, are the next uh, uh, level, we can say, of remote sensing. We are already going aerial here, so increasing our altitude from the surface. The drones has been uh, seen uh, as uh, ideal for uh, short range, uh, short observation times application. Uh, of course, their closeness to the target enables pattern recognition, uh, also with artificial intelligence, and uh, also capability to identify plastic items uh, at, uh, at the very uh, small scale, like we have seen uh, in the presentation of uh, uh, Professor Topuzelis uh, this afternoon. And they also allow to uh, satisfy one of the requirements that uh, I was mentioning before about possibly understanding the nature uh, and the composition of the litter itself uh, and even the material at certain level. And that is uh, the bullet to, uh, that is reported here. So in general, drones are seen very well suited for uh, coastal monitoring. Then we have the next attitude uh, stage of uh, platform, uh, planes, airplanes. At the moment, they have been uh, less exploited due to uh, clearly cost limitation at the research level. So uh, flying a plane uh, costs quite a lot. You have to pay the pilot, you need to pay the fuel. So uh, for, uh, for the research stage as we are, planes has been uh, under exploited at the moment. But they look like a very potential uh, uh, very, very important, sorry, platform for monitoring uh, money litter as well also other form of pollution, by the way, because they are able to carry relatively heavier instrument than drones and uh, of course to fly more distance and so to have a larger ground view compared to drones. And finally, we get to the ultimate uh, uh, sensor in, uh, uh, in, sorry, platform in sense of uh, uh, remote sensing, which are satellites. And uh, we have seen a presentation yesterday, uh, late afternoon. And here we report uh, some of these uh, uh, observation. So satellite, the, one of the main use is uh, for, um, yeah, uh, speaking about optical satellite can inform on accumulation at sea surface. So we, satellite, we can really go on the sea and we can have uh, uh, even daily, in certain cases, uh, uh, view of, uh, of the sea far from the coast as well. Uh, and we can look for directly for uh, concentration, so large accumulation of plastic, uh, or, or proxies of plastic. So uh, knowing that there are accumulation, we can identify the accumulation. We have seen uh, both in the presentation of uh, uh, Manuel Arias and uh, in the presentation of uh, Chuan Minhu, uh, that we are able to identify uh, slick like sort of accumulation that goes under different name, depending on the uh, dynamical formation. It can be like uh, windrows or fronts, and we can do that. With the uh, very high resolution satellite, uh, we can actually uh, help the, the monitoring, especially uh, both on the sea, of course, we can have a, an improved view uh, down to 15, 20, 30 centimeter spatial resolution, we can have an improved view of what the accumulation is about. But and even more, in uh, they can help on, uh, on the beach, so on the coast, uh, due to uh, the uh, more difficult, uh, uh, more complex spectral characterization that uh, the sand uh, uh, imply. Um, we have seen also uh, radar technologies with uh, LAIA today, and also introduced by uh, Manuel yesterday. Uh, uh, radar based, uh, microwave based technology uh, could inform on presence of floating matter, especially in uh, large accumulation and in accumulation which are enough for dampening the waves through which mechanism uh, uh, microwave uh, sensor can detect the presence of something floating on the wave. And possibly, and, but these are still under uh, research uh, as, a, as, a, as a question, possibly maybe we can even uh, separate uh, the, the, the component, the material from other surfactants and other floating material via the dielectric constant study of uh, the signal received. We have seen also the possibility to have uh, thermal infrared uh, deployed for uh, detecting uh, floating plastic by thermal contracts which also allow uh, potentially the use of this technology in the night, something that with all the other optic-based 
technology unless we have an illumination source. So that means uh, speaking about uh, uh, low altitude like drones application, we cannot have, of course, from satellites in the night. Um, we have discussed the fact that uh, uh, remote sensing have limitation, especially at the moment from uh, satellites. Uh, in general, so generally speaking, uh, um, we have uh, a limitation in terms of monitoring frequency, like it happens for satellites, and or spatial coverage, like it is the case for drones. So uh, each of the platform can have its uh, advantages, but has also its limitation. We have a limit in spatial resolution for specific uh, platform, especially for satellite, and some application need to identify specific items. So uh, in this sense, satellite, of course, we have a, a very big limit at the moment, even if we think about very high resolution satellites. Of course, technology will progress. That is a, a instantaneous uh, time shot. Um, there is a separation between the actual floating plastic debris and other components and phenomena is also an issue. So uh, as, as uh, we said, we can detect large accumulation. Uh, we can detect patches, but depending from the platform, so the altitude and the, the distance of our remote sensing, uh, uh, we, we have limits. Um, and uh, uh, um, of course, this uh, depend on the technology you're using, uh, but we know already from the presentation of uh, uh, Chuan Min Hu that we have limits in making this discrimination if we are using only visible bands. Uh, so we need to use other bands, like from the near to the sphere, which at the moment from satellite have more limits. Um, and uh, we need so also to develop uh, instrumentation with adequate uh, spatial resolution, but also with dedicated bands with uh, suitable even uh, bandwidths. For microplastic, well, the, at the moment, uh, quite low overall concentration makes uh, very difficult the use of uh, spectral method to detect the presence of microplastic in the water column. That's something still under research, uh, but we know that the microplastic, microplastic density at the moment uh, seems to be uh, quite low for the uh, uh, especially high altitude platform that uh, we, we can use. Uh, there is, of course, the limit between the size of the items uh, against the spatial resolution and the signal to noise ratio we, we can receive, depending on the platform. And this plays, of course, a very important role, uh, again, depending uh, on what you want to see. So if, if very small items is a compromise in terms of uh, uh, spatial resolution and signal you can get. And this limits, of course, more and more, uh, we uh, go up to satellites. In general, speaking about satellite remote sensing, we know that detect something on the sea is, uh, can be relatively easy. Uh, the, the problems and the big challenge come in discriminating this something uh, with the, the technology we have uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, there was this example of, of uh, Shuamin uh, about uh, the fact that we can uh, uh, detect a uh, uh, slick kind of formation. We have seen also from Manuel, uh, like Windrows and Fronts. Uh, the challenge now is to, uh, uh, so we know that these are accumulation. We have a very great mechanism to, uh, to, 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 to allow us to focus uh, in specific uh, uh, hotspots, but we have a big challenge to uh, be able to provide the reliable information on what is the exact content of that accumulation. So is there, is there um, plastic, for example? And of course, the other big limit that we have is uh, well, a limit that uh, can apply anyway in, uh, in uh, all the cases. We have uh, interference for many elements like uh, the sun glint on the sea, uh, the biofouling that forms on, uh, on the litter that can shield the useful signal, uh, the different size, shape, color of the items we want to see, the fact that uh, in the water they are wet and that's dampen a lot the signal at uh, uh, higher frequency, uh, sorry, at higher wavelength, uh, uh, so lower frequency. So this is a very quick sum up 
draft uh, uh, excuse us the um, the style of the presentation is very textual but that's uh, what was able to produce uh, in a very very short time we are coming now to the uh, part three and um, part three is a breakout discussion so it's uh, actually more a open discussion um, we don't have a panel we want to make it uh, more uh, open so everybody want to intervene and also you from the audience uh, uh, through the Padlet uh, or the Q&A window here in Zoom, please intervene. This is a sort of a real uh, uh, hands-on workshop where we are trying together to, uh, to discuss input that will come, I hope, uh, uh, in, uh, in real time. And actually, in the meantime, I, I also see Manuel uh, join the session. Uh, Manuel was uh, uh, busy in uh, presenting uh, um, the, uh, say, a wrap up, a summary of uh, uh, our events to the final United Nations closure events uh, with the interview from a, a journalist uh, in, the, in the general United Nations uh, framework environment. So, uh, I, hi, Manuel. Hello, everybody. And, uh, I think we now we are at the moment and uh, uh, to uh, share the discussion and launch the uh, let's say this informal uh, panel with the people present right now about uh, well mainly two guiding questions. So, um, Manu, if you're happy, we can uh, we can share now this. Uh, but I'm happy also that uh, you you guide the, the discussion. If it is okay for you. Sure, sure. I can continue. And, uh, but uh, you will need to pass the slides. Well, there are only two, right? Yes. Yeah, we have yeah. only two. Yes. Yes. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you, everybody, for, for joining for this uh, breakout discussion. And uh, thank you also to Paolo for the brilliant summary that uh, he has done from the previous sessions. I think uh, you're having quite a substitute in the key messages and the key aspects that have been discussed during the days uh, uh, yesterday and uh, during this uh, afternoon. Um, uh, uh, in this part, as uh, Paolo has already mentioned, we really want to aim to try to get some uh, useful uh, summary of activities, but also uh, we want to understand better what should be the, the path in which uh, we should follow as community uh, to help us to continue to develop uh, remote sensing as a tool for reporting uh, marine debris, and especially marine plastic uh, debris, which is the main uh, interest of, of this community. So for that, we plant uh, a couple of seeding questions for uh, stirring up a bit of discussion. And the first one is uh, what users, stakeholders, needs and expectations could be aligned with the current and expected short, medium term capabilities of remote sensing? So uh, this question is meant to, to help us to make sure that the remote sensing experts, we understand the needs of the expected users of the data that we are generating. And um, in this in this sense, in this sense, we have already some nice inputs from some of our presenters. So um, uh, some of the conclusions that we got is that this is strongly related to user application or platform, and in the sense that not all technologies and not all types of services have the same requirements. And a matrix of correlated user uh, and needs uh, to for the applications is something that we need to generate. So this type of matrix is very important for the remote sensing experts in order to understand uh, what uh, it is needed and what type of technology we need to use for, for each one. And as a good example uh, that was, uh, was depicted yesterday is how the Port Authority uh, that uh, presented uh, or, or, or they mentioned the need that they have to uh, report on a uh, presence of uh, marine dairy because of it has impact and consequences in navigation. And in particular, what they want to have is an application that warns to navigation on accumulations of debris that can damage propellers. And uh, one of the examples are cost uh, nets or fishing nets and cleaning hardware areas. The need that they have is very high spatial temporal resolution, uh, and they are interested in spotting any type of marine debris, not just plastic. 
And in addition, uh, the platforms that they feel are better suited for them are drones and fixed platforms with very high resolution and multispectral sensors that actually can detect this, uh, this type of terrorists uh, and can be operated uh, directly from ports or even perhaps from the big ships. So um, uh, this is just an example of where we are trying to, to, to get out of this part of the discussion. So um, is there anybody that wants to start uh, proposing things here? Perhaps uh, we can uh, do a round table about the people that are uh, as panelists appearing here. So uh, Costas, uh, you are also running one of those uh, services. So somehow you are in the two ends of the question. You are a remote sensing expert, but you are also a service provider. So uh, in terms of uh, the service that uh, you are uh, creating uh, there in Greece that you have presented very nicely today. Uh, do you have any type of uh, feedback from uh, local authorities or from users that uh, should be taken into account when uh, you are operating and designing the service? Yes, up to now we use it uh, in Greece for a large scale uh, with a charity foundation, Las Carines Charity Foundation, they need to have a service like this because they go to, uh, in the Greek coastline and they clean the beaches, so they need to have a service like this. Um, the, we know that we have a, a limit with the use of the drone, so now, now we are looking for solutions in order to cover larger area. That would be perfect if we can have a fixed wind drone and we can cover uh, kilometers of uh, coastline per day. Um, they are uh, very satisfied with uh, the service because they know where to go and where to collect uh, data sets. And uh, they can um, uh, move their uh, boats towards the specific areas in the coastline. Also, we are in discussions with the local authorities here, the municipalities. They also want to know where uh, they have uh, um, um, accumulation of plastics in the beach, and uh, this is uh, also very nice. They asked us to cover the larger area that we can for, for, for this reason. Uh, they are also very satisfied when they can see uh, that they uh, can uh, use this service in order to, to clean the coastal area. But um, also have to say that they are uh, also very happy when they, we can prove that uh, the beach is cleaned without uh, at least large accumulation of uh, plastics. So uh, the third one is uh, potential use of uh, this service for the uh, port authorities, um, uh, there is a new law coming and the uh, port authorities want to, to, to um, report on the presence of plastics in their area. And uh, I think that uh, this is also quite important. In terms of uh, remote sensing now, uh, everyone wants to have a service that can detect plastics on the beaches, which is uh, understandable. And um, for our next steps, we would like to uh, explore the possibility of connecting the accumulation of plastics on the beaches with the satellite uh, images. This is a question mark for us. And uh, if we are able to do this, at least with a high resolution data set, then we'll be able to analyze and uh, detect uh, plastics in a larger scale and uh, to monitor uh, large areas. Finally, I have to say that uh, the plastic leader project and the artificial targets um, are quite important for the algorithms that we try to build for, for, for the detection of accumulation of plastics in the oceans. Uh, we have seen uh, these data sets to be used from numerous uh, scientists all over the world, and I think that it's quite important to build a network of these uh, artificial targets uh, yeah, on the sea surface. It would be really nice to see other um, uh, groups and uh, uh, initiatives in order to have uh, you know, many places around the globe 
so we can have uh, enough data in order to train the algorithms and uh, be able to do uh, nice uh, to have nice results. Okay, thank you, Costas. So uh, essentially, uh, the use of satellites in this case will become a complementary tool to the drone observations. Uh, so that to provide the spatial coverage, uh, one of the bullet points that we have mentioned about the uh, potential limitations of uh, some specific technologies, uh, to uh, really uh, be able to inform, uh, let's say, at in this case, would be regional scale of the state of the plastic pollution on beaches. Um, but in, from the user's point of view, uh, the feedback that uh, we have been getting uh, during this particular the, the first day, where we get the discussion with the stakeholders. Uh, do you gather any particular aspects uh, related to uh, drone technologies that uh, you didn't think of uh, previously that uh, you might now consider for your future work and of your team? Yes, I think that um, the, um, yeah, the, the, um, specific needs from from these uh, groups that you said uh, um there's a gap between the service that we can uh, provide and uh, the need that they have so we need to uh, specify what we can do and what we cannot do and um, they need to understand what the technology can be done uh, so i have to say that um, there is a possibility of uh, you know, filling this gap and um, we need to uh, sit down and table and uh, discuss their needs and uh, our uh, uh, services. Um, we are in a position now that um, um, we can provide the litter detection using drone data However, we cannot extend this information in large area. The, the, most of the customers, I can say customers or I can I say companies or uh, the need of the service is to cover a very large area. Uh, this is something that uh, it's not possible to be done right now. Uh, we are working on this. And um, I think that um, with the uh, technology that exists and uh, with the uh, knowledge that we have in a few years, this could be uh, something that is possible. Very good. Uh, thanks, Costas. And you have mentioned some, some gaps. Uh, what, what are, uh, I know that maybe you will not uh, recall everything right now, but, but uh, what are the main gaps uh, that uh, you have seen uh, between uh, user expectations and uh, technical possibilities. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, to be to be honest, um, the need is to have to see all the plastics from let's say microplastics in a huge area. So right now we cannot uh, do that. We can see mega plastics, let's say plastics that uh, at least for us are uh, more than a few centimeters. Uh, and we can see it with the use of artificial intelligence. We have some problems on detection, would like to have uh, wavelengths and spectral uh, data sets that uh, they are ideal for the detection of the plastics. These, uh, let's say cameras uh, does not uh, exist right now. We saw a very nice presentation from ELS, from Vito. And um, also we know that uh, we need to expand this in a larger area. So we'd like to have um, a, a, a sensor that can distinguish the plastics or the litter in general from other uh, materials. This also is um, not ready. So this, the, let's say that the technology cannot cover the needs of the market right now. Uh, however, we're working on this. I mean, also, I believe that the last five years is uh, tremendous, the work that we have done, I mean, as a community, we have increased our knowledge uh, really uh, in a high level. And I think that um, if we continue like this, we will be able to deliver something uh, meaningful, meaningful in the following years. So the gaps actually are 
on the way that we use the technology right now? Yeah, that's a very, very nice answer. And uh, I would like to jump now to other of the speakers. And uh, as we have mentioned, microplastics, which uh, it is true, uh, there has been a substantial uh, mention, in, especially in the part two, uh, to this type of uh, applications. And uh, we have even seen a, a talk from Xiaomi Hu, in which uh, he was essentially reporting that uh, with optical data, uh, we could not uh, easily detect uh, the actual concentrations of microplastics in, in our open waters. And uh, then I want to, to, to raise this question to, to Victor Martinez in first place. So, uh, Victor, and um, under your experience in terms of uh, what is the, the use of optical data, what's your view in terms of the, of the potential uh, evolution of remote sensing techniques for uh, microplastics uh, quantification or detection. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the question, Manuel. Uh, well, <clears throat> the, uh, the problem of detection of, uh, of microplastics, uh, it's on, the, not on, the, on their abundance. Uh, as uh, was highlighted yesterday, and the, the, the problem of uh, signal-to-noise ratio uh, is there. It's um, uh, the data we are collecting now, mostly on microplastics, are for uh, uh, millimeters uh, or very small millimeter, like uh, uh, half a, a, a millimeter uh, size of, of plastic. And uh, we know already from optical remote sensing that. Uh, the, the strongest uh, signals in ocean color come from particles that are smaller than that because uh, they have a, a much more uh, efficient way of backscattering the light. Uh, and also because they are, uh, they are uh, much more in, in numbers. So at the moment, uh, they, they, the measurements that we have uh, from ocean color and anything that we can perhaps uh, develop uh, in the future will be, uh, will be uh, challenging, will be, uh, uh, if not impossible. Uh, so uh, we have two alternatives in this scenario. One is to despair and to think uh, there is no solution to this. Uh, the other one is to uh, try to address the challenge in a different way. Uh, or three actually, or the other one is to abandon totally uh, uh, and uh, and think, okay, well, this is nothing uh, we can do about this. We can do uh, uh, something else. I uh, cultivate my my land. So, uh, but if we don't surrender and we think, uh, well, we can try to find some alternative to this. Uh, I think I have uh, uh, at least uh, two options, and it's all indirect. Uh, method. So uh, the first one is to try to uh, identify uh, the uh, optically active substances that uh, correlate uh, with uh, microplastic uh, concentrations. And this uh, might be uh, a bit uh, difficult to find and might be a, a very uh, changeable relationships between, uh, say, uh, total suspended matter uh, and uh, microplastic uh, concentrations. There have been studies already, and uh, they prove that this, uh, uh, this correlation it's, uh, uh, sometimes is not very robust in, in rivers, but uh, it is also very variable. Uh, so uh, it's one of the avenues we are looking into it. The other avenue, also indirect, it's uh, to try to find the uh, proxies. Proxies uh, 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 through uh, the combination of different uh, ways of uh, looking at the ocean. We have already a huge constellation of satellites and uh, looking at the ocean from different points of view with different sensor techniques. Uh, so each of these uh, sensors are giving us a part of, of information, like a puzzle. If we put them together and connect the pieces of the puzzle, we may get uh, some indications of risk areas where accumulation of microplastics uh, may be occurring. So uh, this is, again, not a quantification, not a direct detection, but it's just a, a, an alternative way to resolve this. Then, uh, of course, there are uh, 
other looking forward further away in the future, uh, there might be uh, some uh, some um, uh, novel techniques, uh, and we are looking into those uh, in the IOCCG uh, task uh, force for marine litter uh, detection in the core topic one, which is about technologies, and uh, we're looking at. Uh, uh, techniques such as uh, uh, LiDAR uh, and uh, uh, other ones like um, polarization. But I am not an expert on those, so don't ask me uh, to give you any details on those. <laughs> uh, I hope this uh, addressed the, the question. Sure, and uh, opens also an invitation for uh, Shungu Garawa to tell us about uh, polarimetric techniques. So Shungu, are you with us? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, and do you yes. do you uh, can you please develop in what uh, you think could be uh, the contribution of uh, polarimetric techniques to 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 address the, the needs of uh, users and stakeholders in the remote sensing of uh, plastic debris? All right. Uh, thank you, Manuel, and thank you for the audience for sticking with us until yeah Friday. Uh, it's almost six o'clock. Um, yeah, uh, so the topic of polar, polarimetric studies or polarization, it's still, you know, like we are still doing groundwork on that. So, you know, like polarization has been used over the years to study stress in plastics, but now we're trying to further explore, you know, like try to further investigate if, if we have like with the current technologies and probably like future technologies, if we are going to include polarimetric observations, would they add value or rather like, should we consider just using polarization as one of the tools, but as expressed before, like with the other like speakers before me, we are, we are using remote sensing as a complementary tool. And within the different technologies, we are trying to find complementarity. So, to answer your question related to polar, polarization or polarimetric observations, of course, there is some promising results, um, but I would say, well, my final statement would be stay tuned. Very soon there'll be like publications related to that. Uh, let me not be a spoiler to what's coming. <laughs> Very good replies, and we will for sure be tuned to your uh, scientific publications and of your team to, to, to check on this. And uh, picking up on also one of the comments from, from Victor, in which uh, he has mentioned the possibility of combined technologies, uh, I want now to, to make a question to Laia Romero on this side. Uh, Laia, so yes. uh, in your uh, work, uh, you have been uh, trying to use uh, the detections of uh, floating debris uh, using optical data uh, to train uh, actually uh, machine learning algorithms that are able later on to exploit uh, synthetic aperture radar data to try to, to, to do detections. So how do you think this type of approaches could uh, help to fulfill the, 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 the needs of the users and stakeholders? I think that, uh, well, from my experience and then seeing other, like some of the presentations, I always get the feeling that maybe when I speak, I don't, I don't sound too optimistic. <laughs> and then I feel that in reality, the results that we get are to be very optimistic in the sense that, um, that we are demonstrating that we can detect marine litter and that it can be a combined a combined effort by using as you are saying optical data with SAR data um, in this case and it is the only I see it like the only way to go like from my perspective um, trying to tackle uh, and like targets on the ocean with only optical data is you, you are uh, way more expert than I am in optical data, but uh, it's really, really challenging. I think that a combined approach makes all the sense. Also on the topic of the microplastics, if we are looking at, um, at roughness, we should be able to, 
to address different densities on the on the like from the water surface it's not like theory theoretically it's not a, an impossible approach of course the signal to noise ratio is also a very big problem for the SAR signal but um, I would not abandon like Victor was suggesting in one of the options I, I think we should really go into the lab and and make measurements on a, like experimental measurements on on controlled experiments with different bands with different um, types of materials and in different conditions of wind, uh, especially. Yes, indeed. Uh, actually, uh, one of the limitations that I know for optical data is specifically the, the cloud. Uh, Coverage, which as, as we all know, it uh, makes it impossible to use uh, optical data from satellites to, to retrieve uh, information from the surface. Um, so, obviously, uh, using uh, active uh, methods like uh, synthetic aperture radar are quite good to, to cover or to fill this, this, this mm -hmm. gap, this space uh, that uh, optical data is, is, is providing. And uh, thanks a lot for that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, just a reminder to everybody, uh, the, it is not just us, the panelists, who, who may contribute. So if anybody from the audience uh, wants to give uh, his or her two cents, uh, please uh, feel free to, to let us know. And um, uh, now, from my point of view also, uh, I have been working more in the, in the particularly in the last uh, two years, in the use of uh, uh, proxies for 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 marine lethal detection, and uh, one of the the, the aspects that uh, has come to to us, which could be interesting, is precisely the something that uh, Victor has mentioned is the possibility to uh, not just focus in direct detection of uh, marine plastic litter or marine debris, but also in trying to uh, use uh, proxies or other elements that are much easier. To, uh, to, to, uh, to detect the satellite, but that they can inform about the uh, presence of, uh, of, of marine plastic. The, the advantage of this is that if you have a good model able to link uh, these uh, proxies with actual uh, presence of uh, marine debris or marine plastic litter, you, you, you can have a solution for, for reporting in this type of contamination. On the other hand, uh, by, because of we are using proxies, we are not uh, Quantifying uh, with enough accuracy, uh, probably uh, the, the the quantities uh, that are required by by the end users and by the stakeholders. So it's something to to pick it up, and uh, probably is one of the ways forward uh, as a first order approach. But uh, probably for the future, we will have also to uh, to to dive more into uh, detection techniques. So one of the aspects that has been Said mentioned the uh, well and directly mentioned also during the, the session this morning is that uh, and yesterday is that the the, the detection of uh, floating uh, marine plastic and floating marine debris uh, at the ocean with optical data uh, it is also a problem of uh, spectral mix mixing uh, which uh, within the pixel that makes uh, much harder. The, the detection. So, Shami, who yesterday was talking about uh, the contrast of uh, spectral bands uh, between the water and the target that you have. But uh, on top of that, we should that uh, the mixing that we often have when litter is present is not just water and plastic. Uh, we have water, plastic, quite often we have seaweeds and even dead wood. And uh, this is one of the reasons why the, the type of uh, experiments that uh, are being done by Costas with artificial targets and testing different types of floating materials is very important for us because we need really to understand uh, the, the different contributions, uh, spectrally speaking, uh, that uh, the different compounds uh, of substances in each of the pixels uh, will have. Um, uh, moving forward, I think, uh, Paolo, we can try to jump to the next uh, next slide. So the, the second uh, point uh, or question that we wanted to, to address in this breakout discussion is, which are the next steps to advance and match tech capabilities and expectations 
based guidelines possibly under a mandate of the UN Decadal Action in the frame of the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. So uh, the, the purpose of this is really is to help as a remote sensing of a marine litter, plastic and marine debris as a whole community in order to improve uh, our level of coordination and also to address uh, what are our common needs in a way to make more strength uh, in the decision making process and get uh, further for the support. One of the ideas of the Ocean Decades uh, objectives is precisely to reinforce uh, global initiatives that are able to make a difference and to the, the, that they embrace people from different uh, branches and they can address specific uh, targets for, for each of those uh, Ocean Decade objectives. Those are called decadal actions and, uh, uh, and those decadal actions have some expected outcomes from the point of view of the United Nations. So, for instance, in the context of the uh, plastic, uh, marine plastic debris, there is a very specific uh, final objective which is able to uh, define um, a, a clear uh, marine uh, plastic debris index which can be used by decision-making uh, organizations, uh, politicians, and governments to check, uh, in first place, what are the main uh, areas impacted by, by the problem. In second, thing, in second stage, to uh, put in place uh, mitigation methodologies. And in third step, uh, to check what is the impact of those uh, mitigation uh, measurements into the plastic pollution. And for that, they really request for a particular or a specific uh, marine debris index that can be a uh, device by combining remote sensing with, of course, in situ observations, citizen science, etc. So initiatives uh, like uh, the one that we have seen uh, presented by LIA, like Ocean Scan, they help to gather this data together, which eventually needs to be uh, processed and tackled to really uh, build up uh, the simple, easy to understand information that uh, can help into the governance of this problem. So during the event, we have a few, a few inputs in this in this line already, and uh, requests from from the different presenters and uh, the derived also from the participation from the community. The first one is uh, having expert groups to provide synthesis of a state of the art for technologies, algorithms, data sets, interdisciplinary aspects, as we are already doing in the IOCC task force, and to identify tech gaps where to put fu uh, funding for tech schools and filling knowledge gaps. So this is one of the, uh, the, the, the next steps that uh, we see as community are, are required. And the second one is uh, use monitoring platforms of technologies in synergy we have already discussed it uh, just right now about that, and promote applications which are already implementable with drones and planes, for example, and to boost the ground truth collections to be shared as much as possible via interoperable open access databases. This, this point, just that there was some, even a specific question uh, that was rising, why it's so difficult to, to, uh, to, to get uh, open access to, to data sets, and uh, we must say that uh, at least at the IOCC task force, uh, there is a core topic led by Shungu that precisely is trying to, to, to help on this. And actually, he already presented about this, uh, about this, this point. The, the third uh, element is to coordinate internationally outside of the remote sensing area. And uh, one of the main uh, aspects in which uh, the remote sensing community can, can work with other uh, communities that are interested in marine libraries through the uh, integrated marine debris observatory system framework. Uh, this indoors uh, concept was endorsed by a substantial number of researchers from different domains uh, uh, during uh, the Ocean Ops 2019. And there was even a white paper presented by the community. And obviously, this is a quite ambitious. Uh, difficult target to obtain, but nevertheless, it's still the, the global objective that, uh, that uh, we are setting up a global community for, for, the, for developing their uh, monitoring tools. And um, uh, this is one of the things that is being also requested, is more coordination. 
And uh, the next bullet point is uh, data for development and validation is missing, as well as supporting training of artificial intelligence techniques. Initiatives like Ocean Scan Database and the Manager Project for Ground Truth are very important for this effort. So it is well known that uh, for developing uh, retrieval methodologies using remote sensing techniques, you need uh, to have also ground truth data. Uh, this ground truth data is used both for development and validation. And this ground truth data, it is not just needed for, for remote sensing, eventually it's also needed for models. Uh, that uh, that they will use also data from remote sensing. So at the end, uh, not getting enough ground truth information is one of the main limitations we have in development. Uh, actually, uh, Caleb presented uh, even today that uh, despite of that they are also working uh, very successfully in the textures of land in places, uh, they still need to uh, develop a significant training data sets uh, for uh, having artificial intelligence solutions to operate in other areas of the globe be beyond the areas that they have been working so far. Um, this just highlights the, the difficulty we are facing, but uh, uh, in a number of initiatives that have been run already by the Open Space Agency, it has been also an issue. And the, 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 the next bullet point is that artificial intelligence, I just mentioned it, is considered an emerging tool that the community is using more and more and that it is likely to be a keystone of the remote sensing of marine litter. So this uh, is an important point. Uh, many other presentations we have seen the last uh, two days uh, have a certain level of integration of artificial intelligence technologies. And, um, and it looks like the community is pushing towards this integration farther and farther because it seems to be very well suited for, uh, for the marine debris. Uh, uh, detection and for the plastic detection and uh, perhaps one of the objectives that we could have as community is to increase the literacy of remote sensing experts in artificial intelligence which could be one way one tool to uh, push uh, further into this uh, particular objective and the last bullet point is obviously more funding for agencies for remote sensing obviously and uh, this is kind of a given uh, requirement, but uh, we must say that uh, remote sensing, even if uh, we are, have been already uh, for five years around, that is a very short period of time in terms of research and development. And actually, uh, it is amazing, as Costa has mentioned already, that in only five years, there are already uh, quite promising uh, techniques and solutions. Uh, probably the progress in some particular platforms like drones have, have evolved much faster. Uh, but uh, there is a still a uh, good way uh, still in front of us to actually be able to uh, provide global maps based in, in remote sensing data. Um, so far, those are the, the main aspects uh, that we have uh, condensated from these days um, that the community has reported to, to us in terms of the next steps. But now I want to jump to, to uh, our speakers again to see uh, whether they have uh, additional contributions to, to this list. So uh, perhaps uh, we can start um, this time with uh, Victor to change the order a bit. Victor, you want to give you two cents on this? Or three? Or my, or my half penny, <sighs> yes. Uh, the, uh, I am. Uh, yeah, I, I think these are uh, are very important uh, uh, topics. Uh, uh, this morning there was another parallel uh, satellite activity, which was the Indos uh, uh, one. Um, my uh, my idea my idea is that uh, our first that the remote sensing part will contribute to the Indos uh, submission to a um, to. A, a, uh, ocean Decade uh, program as an, as a as a but the structure as an as a as a project or 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 a very very self contained uh, uh, and very uh, we're we're very we're already very uh, very well organized uh, through the uh, IOCCG task force uh, uh, on on their side I, I I hope that some of the people that uh, was this morning in the session from Indos. Will be here and it will be very nice to hear from them uh, i think uh, on the next steps uh, uh, to move uh, towards this uh, there will be uh, 
we will hopefully be using uh, the notes from the meeting and uh, perhaps this uh, the list of participants uh, to this satellite event to uh, to uh, contact uh, uh, and uh, probably get uh, some information about that but uh, we have already a, a core group uh, of people who will be uh, working on this uh, on the basis of the IOCCG task force. Uh, uh, other than this is uh, another aspect of this is uh, the possibility of linking with uh, biodiversity uh, observation. And next week there will be a workshop on bio biodiversity uh, 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 observation of uh, floating uh, algae. And some of the participants in this satellite activity will be also there. Uh, and it uh, it has been uh, uh, recognized that there is quite a lot of overlap, uh, uh, especially in uh, in observation requirements. So this this uh, should be uh, further discussed and, um, and optimized. So that we don't do, uh, we can do just uh, one observing system that maybe uh, could uh, fulfill uh, various sets of observations, I don't know. But, uh, or at least uh, one of uh, uh, looking at it from the remote sensing uh, 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 part. Uh, that's it. Very nice, Victor. So uh, if I understood well, particularly from your, your last uh, comment on this, uh, what you mean is that uh, increasing the interdisciplinarity of, uh, the, of the remote sensing community that uh, works in my leader by introducing some other communities that maybe are not exactly interested in the same topic, but uh, they may have similar requirements, uh, it could be a, a good idea, right? I think it is an idea to be explored. Uh, is so that we don't duplicate uh, the effort mm. in different groups, and then you have to move from one group to another to see what the other people are doing. And uh, I think uh, we should be perhaps thinking a bit wider uh, uh, for the work we do and uh, and try to integrate uh, more aims. Uh, I, I see, uh, for instance, when you develop a, a satellite mission, uh, you have uh, several. Um, aims uh, to measure so uh, and and in the end you you develop one satellite that it's able to fulfill several uh, types of requirements uh, uh, you, you for instance you have sentinel 2 who was originally designed for land uh, observation but then there is some of the wavelengths that are perhaps more for water and uh, and uh, the marine and aquatic community can take advantage of those. So uh, it is that kind of uh, integration. So we can all uh, benefit from the same sort of effort and, and all push together towards uh, a, an aim, uh, whatever it may be. But I think uh, there are some commonalities and uh, uh, we're exploring them now. Yes, uh, and that is a very good comment uh, because of uh, actually uh, particularly for, for, for the satellite component, uh, we know that uh, we don't have a, a ad purpose made sensor flying on the space that is really meant to, to, to measure plastic pollution. So one could imagine that uh, we could uh, define or design uh, a specific uh, sensor or platforms able to uh, be more efficient than the, than the current technologies, which may uh, resolve some of uh, of our existing issues for for the remote sensing. So, in this context, uh, do you have any particular uh, recommendation of what you think uh, technology should should evolve towards to to improve our uh, potential capabilities for detecting marine plastic debris? Oof, if I had uh, one straight away from the top of my head, uh, I wouldn't be here. I'd be constructing uh, <laughs> a, a, a satellite uh, uh, myself or, or, or putting that proposal uh, uh, on the table to, to ISA. But uh, no, at the moment, uh, I think we're doing what we should be doing. It's uh, pushing the technologies that we have uh, currently, realizing, learning, what it's currently possible with what we have and what it is not, uh, uh, and defining uh, perhaps the next steps uh, with uh, more uh, integration of, of other uh, of different uh, data sources. 
and uh, perhaps uh, looking at the same technologies, but at different uh, uh, scales of observation. Things like uh, hubs, we haven't yet uh, uh, high altitude uh, platforms, uh, we haven't uh, evaluated yet, uh, and we don't know what is their potential. So, uh, um, so I think uh, there are uh, avenues at the moment, but uh, I don't have uh, the uh, perfect uh, response, and I don't have uh, uh, an agenda that uh, I got. So I'm, uh, I would like to share it with you if I had one straight away. But I think uh, it is important to listen to requirements and to connect uh, to the communities because uh, several brains uh, connecting together and being open. Uh, are uh, much more efficient than one perhaps limited brain like mine. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Victor. And uh, now, uh, jumping with the same uh, question or next steps, uh, Laia, do you have any uh, recommendations in terms of uh, what uh, we should be doing as community or from the technological point of view? Uh, to further develop uh, capabilities to use remote sensing for marine plastic litter. Are you asking me? Did you say Laia? Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> I was yes. not sure. Uh, thank you, Manuel. I think that what you mentioned about the need for data, well, I really appreciate it, but it's very much on point. When everything that we are developing on AI needs for this ground truth. And, and the same thing with the lab experiments. Like we, we are at a point where in very little time, we advanced a lot in what we know of the technologies. We have a much better criteria uh, because we have already compared a lot of things and, and, and analyzed a lot of things. But the effort on getting this data to build a very solid ground, so to say, in order to further develop these knowledge and technologies is a first uh, need from my perspective. And, and we should look into what drones can do, what planes can do. I think that having this standardized repository of data that is accessible will greatly help. And yeah, and, and funding is necessary because many of us, we are spending, we're putting a lot of effort into these initiatives because we are passionate about what we do. But there is a moment where we need, um, I think, some sort of investment from, from institutions or from, I don't know, to go into deeper into the studies that we are doing. And yeah, I think data, yeah, access to data, sharing the data and a way of collecting data in a way that is very much aligned with what is needed by the remote sensing community. And the combination of, this, of the sensors, not only satellites, but platforms, the drones, the planes. Um, there are many people that are being able to see plastic patches on land and on the ocean and on rivers, and we should bring all of those efforts together. Very nice answer, Laia. Thank you very much. And from respect to uh, to you also, Laia, uh, respect to the technological push, uh, because you come more from the active uh, sensing community, uh, do you think it is, should there should be any particular uh, technological push or uh, or, or perspective uh, for uh, further improving uh, the technology and to help the uh, marine litter, marine plastic litter detection? What, what is a technology push? In what way? Because yeah, to so me, technology instance, push sounds bad. It's <laughs> what, no, uh, it means, for instance, if uh, you are thinking that uh, you are using synthetic aperture radar, so for instance, uh, you, you think a spatial resolution from SAR is enough, we will need uh, to improve it. Is the signal to noise ratio sufficient or we should improve uh, somehow uh, our uh, uh, the, 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 the sensitivity of uh, our instruments? 
of course, things, we, yes. the thing is, like, of course, we should improve it. And it's not only improve it. It is an analysis and it is a compromise. Because if you are able to capture certain things in your signal, you will be, I mean, there. it is a compromise. You will lose a lot of things. Like what you gain in resolution, you will uh, lose it um, on, on the sensitivity it's, or the cost is also an issue. Like it is the, the system design overall that we should be looking into. But to get to that point, we still have many things to answer. And I guess that the same applies for other technologies. So without um, this information and these analysis and these experiments, it is difficult to imagine how a future mission should be, like if we had to like write it down. <laughs> um, but what I know, it is worth the money or the effort that is put into because the need for this to be working by society is really high. So I think that we should move forward and think that the benefit of, of this knowledge that is being created is great for, for communities, for all of us as humans in the planet. So we should, I like very much this idea in which we are trying to highlight the importance of the work that we are developing from a very societal perspective. So what will this, uh, because if it is a mission that will solve such uh, great problems, okay, then we should take it into account very seriously <laughs> and put uh, and do this technology push that I think that is what you are suggesting, no? In a positive way, so to say, to, to, to invest more on the technology, I guess. Okay, great, uh, great answer, Laya. Actually, it is true. There is a uh, paradox in terms that uh, for uh, identifying uh, more suitable uh, uh, technologies, or, or let's say to make the technologies to evolve, first we need to identify the most optimal uh, detection principles, uh, which is essentially uh, where most part of the community of remote sensing is uh, still working, particularly in the satellite side of the things, uh, to try to uh, produce some, some, some initial algorithms, initial detection principles that obviously uh, they are being done with existing data sets and technologies, but that uh, they could pro prove to be the seed of identifying what are the current limitations so that we can uh, feed that back to the, uh, the engineering and technology component of remote sensing to try to address these this particular problems. But getting back to, to, to these uh, next steps, I, I would like now to know from, from Shungu Garaba. Uh, Shungu, what are your views in terms of, um, of uh, the next steps uh, that we should do as a community, as a group working in this topic? Do you have any recommendation for this, for this group? Shungu? I think uh, Sungu is not with us. So I put the same question to, to Costas. So Costas. Uh, I'm here, Manuel. Sorry, my ah, speaker okay, just, okay. <laughs> just died. It just died on me. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Sungu, please. Uh, what was the question again? Sorry about that. No. Uh, uh, what was your recommendation in terms of next steps that you want to uh, send uh, or share with uh, with the remote sensing community and that we could frame to the United Nations? Oh, so that's a very good question, and I think yeah, the starting point is we have done as like you know toddler steps. We have done a toddler step by forming you know like a united front with the IOCCG task force. And, you know, like the next step is we have several projects which are running like re scientific evidence-based activities that are being conducted across the world, like in Europe and also in the USA. And um, I think the next step is to motivate the other, well, other entities or uh, scientific, scientific community to build upon some of the findings we have already 
so that we can quickly advance the field and then try to come up with uh, suitable ways. So we have seen some presentations today showing already like the use of current tools and then try to move, you know, like if we are going to build a sensor, like uh, Victor was saying, uh, if we're going to build a sensor, it should be based on robust, you know, studies and calibration and validation. And we already have information that also makes the sensor useful to other communities, you know, interdisciplinary applications. And the, of course, like the main message I'll repeat again, it's like making things open access. We have to make things open access. And yeah, I think that's the main message. Uh, you're muted, Mano. Thank you, Sungo. And uh, indeed, it's uh, quite an uh, often asked question is uh, what about uh, data? But the problem is not just limited to data. And uh, just uh, there was even who suggested to have a repository of uh, retrieval algorithms that can be available to the community. So there are a lot of people uh, that are really looking for this type of algorithms because they are eager eager to use them. And obviously there is uh, this uh, particular problem that we can mention about the uh, maturity of the different algorithms, which is one of the, possibly one of the main reasons why uh, uh, there is still some reluctancy uh, from the community to, to share this type, of, uh, this type of things. But uh, one could imagine in the future uh, to have uh, particular platforms or even uh, set of toolboxes where uh, users can uh, interface with ground truth data and satellite data at the same time that they are trying to run or test uh, existing or new algorithms uh, for, for, for this. And uh, moving uh, further into the into discussion, we have now with us uh, Shami Hu, which uh, was one of our uh, panelists yesterday. And uh, Shamin, just for, for your uh, awareness, we are right now discussing uh, what will be the next steps uh, to advance and match the capabilities and expectations uh, within the area, of course, of, of remote sensing that uh, we would like as a group to convey to, to the global community and in particular to the United Nations within the, the, the ocean decade and the decade actions frame. So, I have a question for you is, what are, from your point of view, uh, considering the current state uh, of the things in terms of uh, remote sensing, what should be a uh, your recommendation uh, about uh, what we should do next? So you, you have any suggestion, any recommendation to do? Well, thank you, Manu, for the opportunity to speak up. Um, sorry, I missed the first part of this. I just finished my class, um, so I jumped in the, the session. What, what you have on the screen is, is great. Um, I think these are the necessary steps. In my point of view, um, the algorithm part okay, is not mature. And uh, especially from a user perspective, uh, there's no mature algorithm to give you, say, mm -hmm. oh, I have an input of a set of data. I have an output of a debris like uh, or look like you know, image. Um, I don't think there's such a capacity yet. Um, so that's the, the, the one way to improve. Um, what I think uh, the, you know, the, the critical requirements now are you know, actually part of this screen uh, printout. The data, okay, where are the ground truth data? And where are the, the spectral library, you know, whatever you know, data you call it. You mentioned a, a data repository. Uh, I think uh, Shengu mentioned IOCCG has a, an archive of a metadata to at least to tell the user where to find those data. It's not in one place, but uh, you know, the capacity is, is there. And I, I perhaps I, you know, I, I don't think having all the data in one place is necessary as long as you know, or a user knows where to find the data, get the data, and you know, that, that should be sufficient. But in my point is the data, Grunchos data, spectral data. 
and uh, we, we don't have a lot of data to play with. I know, you know, there are a lot of efforts to archive data. I think that that's, that's a good start. I heard some presentations you know, for data archive. You know, that, that's a great effort. Um, the, so number two on this, on this slide, emphasize this. I wholeheartedly agree with this. Uh, thanks a lot, Shamin. Uh, uh, but uh, another another question uh, for you. Um, this is a bit uh, perhaps more difficult, but uh, if we had to do some technological development to, to improve uh, the detection of uh, marine uh, debris or marine plastic uh, litter, um, the, what aspects of the technology you think we need to, to improve or to evolve to, let's say, uh, have in the future the optimal sensor or the optimal retrieval algorithm for 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 detecting marine plastic litter from from space, for example. Well, I'm a person. I'm an ocean color person. I can I only talk about optics. You know, there are other sensors. So from the the perspective of optics, um, I think a spatial resolution is more important. The spectral resolution. So if I have the same cost, I'm restricted by cost, I would rather have a, a sensor of just a few meter resolution than having 50 spectral bands. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, the, the, the small targets. Um, also for you know, technology development, we really want to differentiate the different floating materials. So as long as we have enough bands you know, to detect all those spectral signatures, there are some narrow band spectral wiggling. If we have enough bands to that, that that's it. And for plastics, we do need more, have more uh, swirl bands to pinpoint the, the plastics. And currently there are several sensors with uh, two swirl bands or three swirl bands. Those are not enough. Uh, we, we need more swirl bands. So that's for the techniques. For the algorithm, I really want to suggest, you know, when we want to perform or test the algorithm, um, we want to put more spectral end members. I mean, if you have an either or situation, that's very easy, right? Either marine debris or water, that, that's very easy. But you have different types. So let's you know, challenge ourselves as algorithm developers. So in a natural environment, suppose you know nothing about the region, you perhaps have uh, you know, floating sea grid, you have uh, plastics, you have non-plastics, you have uh, you know, the, the solid objects. Um, so, can we do a better job than right now to at least to differentiate different classes? Um, that's what I see as a major challenge. Um, of course, that's related to data availability. Even if you say, you know, I have five classes classified. How do you trust it? Where is the ground truth that's related to this data? So they, they really tangle with each other. Uh, but as the group, you know, we have several different groups. We can each, you know, well, it's not just within the group, the entire community, I see a lot of attendees. Uh, we can each work on those different directions you know, to make a contribution. Uh, but from my point of view, it's really the confusion matrix. That, that is the, the, the challenge right now. Thanks a lot, uh, Shomiku. And uh, we have also uh, an important point that uh, was also mentioned uh, yesterday related to the, um, uh, to the importance of uh, the effective spatial resolution of sensors respect to the size of the targets, right? So uh, sensitivity to a particular uh, material floating in the surface will be related not only to the sign and to the ratio of the sensor, but also to the uh, apparent size that it has or how much it contributes within within the pixels. 
So uh, current uh, public no commercial uh, spectral satellites are uh, having uh, and probably sentiment is one of the best in this sense. Uh, they have some bands in 10 meters spatial resolution, but others uh, like uh, Landsat 8, uh, they are more in the 20. So nevertheless, we are one could say that uh, we put together the two sensors and the different resolutions or different bands, we are in an effective resolution of 20 meters. Uh, does any of the panelists uh, that work more in, in, in the sense of, uh, of optical data uh, feeling that uh, 20 meters is enough to, to report in marine plastic pollution or we should uh, try to aim for a um, better spatial resolution for, for this purpose. Anybody wants to, to, to jump into this question? I can go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to be honest, right now with a 10 meter resolution of Sentinel-2, we're already facing uh, significant problems to do the detection. As uh, Sean Ning said before, we need, uh, in my point of view, much better resolution in order to be able to say uh, with some confidence that we can distinguish the plastic accumulation from the other floating material. So um, I'm, I'm very optimistic about uh, the use of uh, 20 meters. I think that we should go a bit, uh, uh, we should aim at least in a bit more uh, uh, spatial resolution. And uh, we should also aim to focus on, on wave bands that uh, they are quite important uh, for us. So um, uh, it's a trade-off between the spatial resolution that we would like to have and the spectral resolution that we uh, would like to have. It is, these two things have to go together. So um, um, I think that we should be pressed a lot in order to, to, to have sensors that are working with better resolution uh, in the coastlines and also to focus on wave bands that are important for us. Uh, and also I would like to comment on your previous uh, question of what we have to do. I think it is very important what we are really doing right now to interconnect between us, uh, exchange ideas and knowledge. This is the very, very important in, in, in all cases. Also, it is very important uh, to have data sets. All the previous uh, speakers uh, spoke about this. Um, we have developed a communi community which is uh, devoted in, in this subject. This is already a very good uh, step forward. And um, I think that will be also very uh, important for, for the future to have at least uh, a few successful cases of the detection uh, of marine litter. Once we have a uh, you know, few of them, one, two, uh, will be really nice and we'll have the proof of the concept that uh, this can work. So we can uh, go further and, and press even more. Thank you, Costas. Any, any other view in this uh, particular question? Oh, can, can I chime in again? Sure, sure, sure. So the, the, the resolution requirement depends on the size of the object. Um, so the, in terms of a percentage of a pixel size, okay, is only a function of signal to noise. Um, so for uh, Sentinel-2, with the current signal to noise, the detection limit is 1% of a 10 meter pixel size. 1% uh, of a 10 meter, so that's one meter square. Um, so that means if you aggregate all the scattered material within the pixel, if it's more than one meter square, it's detectable, <laughs> right? So for the same signal to noise, if we have a better resolution, like uh, with a world view, with a dove, 
you know, can de de detect a smaller thing. But the problem is with those high resolution sensors, you don't have enough spectral bands. That's how quite often you have three bands and four bands. Um, but recently, uh, the planet scope has this a super dope. You know, I have just you know, look at the spectra. I haven't really played with the data. The super dope uh, constellation has eight spectral bands at a three meter resolution. Um, because it's a constellation, it for certain regions, coastal regions, it provides a daily revisit or even every every two days, you can have an image. Um, so unlike the the digital globe world view, well, if you're lucky, you may have an image, you know, for for that year, right? So for the moving target of uh, marine debris or plastic or marine litter, you know, the high resolution and high revisit frequency, those are the key. And uh, this is a super, this is a commercial sensor, unfortunately. Uh, they may have some data policy, but uh, I see currently that's perhaps the, the most appropriate sensor for this exact purpose, you know, for the marine litter monitoring. It, it does not cover open ocean. Okay. It's most coastal region and the land, but the capacity is there. Uh, it's eight bands near infrared uh, for red edge reflectance and also 670 nanometer for the pigment absorption. So at least we can differentiate between vegetation and the non-vegetation. Then look at the spectral shape, we may tell further you know, if it's non-vegetation, what type of non-vegetation. So the, the, the capacity is there. Uh, and uh, of course, if uh, the money is enough, um, if the, the ESA, ESA or NASA is, wants to, we can derive, uh, develop our own satellite, small satellite, you know, with the spectral bands more suitable than the existing sensors for marine litter. We, we know the band requirement. We know the carbon hydrogen absorption locations, right? So if we just place six, eight bands in those absorption locations, we can quantify the, the reflectance trial, the depths of the reflectance trial. And the people have been using average and this principle to quantify oil slip thickness. Now that's a carbon hydrogen band bound absorption, the same principle. Um, but if we don't, we don't need, we don't need uh, 300 bands you know, for the, those you know, absorption features. If we have several neighboring bands and the peak bands, you know, we have a lot of tricks to play with. Yes, thank you, uh, Shomin. Uh, actually, uh, I I agree uh, with you uh, because of actually the the work that uh, we did for for Rosmari, which uh, basically has a, an overarching goal to try to do recommendations for for a future mission. Uh, we came with the same type of conclusion that uh, we didn't have to go for a hyperspectral like uh, mission to operate in optics to to do a a good uh, retrieval, but uh, we needed more uh, bands that being provided by a multi-spectral mission. So somehow we are falling in the middle uh, between the two types of uh, technologies or, or types of sensors um, in terms of requirements. Uh, we need narrow bands to do an accurate specification and discrimination, but uh, and perhaps some larger number of bands that the usual multi-spectral sensor but not necessarily uh, hundreds of bands has been provided by other types of hyperspectral sensors like Prisma. And um, I think uh, we have done a very nice uh, round table right now. Is there anybody uh, wants to throw up on the table anything else, uh, any other comment or recommendation for the next steps right now? Manuel? I yes. I have my uh, hand raised. I was just wanting to comment on uh, on the requirements that uh, Chuan Min sure. was raising and uh, and something that we were discussing before he joined in about uh, the potential for for connecting or expanding uh, 
the the requirements uh, of marine litter to uh, to connect with those of uh, of some aspects at least of, of biodiversity i know uh, from reading uh, wor work in that community of biodiversity that uh, uh, they are faced, uh, especially in the coastal areas, with uh, requirements of uh, uh, higher revisit times, uh, so more frequent observations, uh, uh, finer spatial resolutions. They, they also want uh, a higher spectral resolution, but we, we, we may not need that. So, uh, and they're thinking about, uh, or at least uh, one of the works I was looking at, uh, was uh, discussing ideas of uh, of constellations. So, um, uh, and I wanted to to uh, to ask uh, Chuan Min if uh, uh, what does he what do you think about uh, um, uh, try to to widen the the type of uh, of approach that we have at the moment on the marine litter to to uh, to encompass some of the aspects of the biodiversity. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Victor, for, for raising this. Um, You're exactly right. A, a more and more effort nowadays is focused on marine, di marine biodiversity. And uh, so marine litter should play a, a big, big, bigger role in, in this aspect um, it, because it's really part of the ecosystem. And uh, it's harmful, it could also be a habitat for many marine animals. Um, so in that regard, uh, we also need more spectral bands, that's my opinion, to quantify the different floating matters, different types of marine litter. Um, I'm not sure if I'm on the point. Um, I may have missed your point, Victor. Uh, Yes, no, my, my point was mainly uh, we at the moment have this uh, community which is uh, focusing very narrowly on, uh, on marine litter and, uh, uh, and trying to, to define requirements there. But if, if we were looking forward into the, into the further away future, like uh, 10 years time, uh, would we want to, uh, to, uh, to expand or the requirements uh, and to encompass uh, the marine the, the marine biodiversity one, or is it better if each uh, community uh, sort of uh, follows their own path and we will connect at some point in the future anyway? <laughs> but uh, oh, well, that, that's a great question. Um, I think that the answer should be yes. Um, because marine litter, even if let's say we have a, a map, a very precise map of marine litter distribution, so what? I mean, how is marine litter related to marine biodiversity? And it, it, it must have an impact on this, either ephemeral or persistent, it should have an impact. So what is the relationship with the marine di bio biodiversity? I don't know if anybody has looked into this yet. Uh, but that's that's a great question, and uh, that I think is the future because um, for, we have talked about this reason. Another reason is um, I think some speakers have talked about this already. Um, so even if we don't detect marine litter itself, we can detect the 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 the, the environment that is likely to have marine litter, right? A marine front, a convergence zone, all those. That's related to marine litter. And that is also related to marine biodiversity. Yes. So in other words, marine litter is directly and indirectly related to marine biodiversity. And we should connect with that community. I know there's a, a M -Bon, uh, network, you know, marine observe uh, diversity observing network. Um, so this group, th this community, the marine litter community, should connect to that community. Yes, yes, is exactly what I'm. Uh, I'm thinking of doing uh, very, <laughs> very soon, like next week. But <laughs> I uh, and I know that uh, you're involved in that uh, discussion. But I think it is worth uh, that uh, uh, this 
community of marine litter also is is aware of what is going on and, and progress uh, in parallel and, and in convergence uh, with uh, with the other uh, as uh, as especially if, if we're talking about floating matter marine litter is just one of those uh, parts of the floating uh, aspects that can be uh, in uh, found there so yes thank you very much uh, Shamin. Well, thank you. I have spoken too much. <laughs> it, it is okay. We, we are already uh, having a more relaxed discussion in this, in this part, so not, not to worry. And uh, actually, uh, this is one of the bullet points also we, 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 we have seen rising during the, during the meeting, which is the, the international coordination, including outside of the remote sensing area. So uh, we should uh, not limit ourselves to think just in the military and we should not just uh, limit ourselves in the remote sense. And there is a, a cross, uh, uh, how to call it, uh, uh, there is a, a crossing road uh, with other communities and we should try to take this advantage. Uh, in particular, if we want to uh, develop a specific or a missions. So one of the points I like from what uh, uh, Shamin uh, has, has highlighted is that uh, one of the concerns uh, that uh, we could hear in some, some of the satellite activities was that uh, there is a belief that uh, remote sensing cannot provide the data with sufficient, um, uh, how to say this, frequency in terms of time. And uh, well, we can, we can see that that, that is not a technological limitation. Actually, uh, it is just a, a current uh, limitation because of most of the constellations of satellites or uh, single missions, they are not um, being designed for, for, for those frequencies, but it is feasible from the technical point of view. And uh, if there is a, a strong need from, from the and the users and stakeholders will get daily information about uh, plastic uh, pollution or marine debris pollution. That is also something that can be embraced by the remote sensing community and in particular uh, by the space agencies and the space sector in general to, 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 uh, to embrace this, this as a requirement for future, for future mission design. And, uh, uh, continuing with this, uh, as I was saying before, uh, anybody has any other question uh, or comment to do uh, before we go to the final comments? No? Then I want to, to thank you to, to our panelists and I would like to, uh, because we are benefiting from from a space science representative, uh, Paolo. Uh, do you want to make a particular statement from the from your side uh, in terms of uh, what has been discussed in this breakout session that uh, you could uh, perhaps uh, uh, take uh, take home uh, for, for for your peers to discuss into? Thank you, Manuel, for uh, <clears throat> passing uh, the floor. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you all. I am actually uh, honored to, to, to be involved in the, such a committee that I feel uh, is, uh, is growing. Uh, it's grown uh, in the last uh, four or five years uh, very rapidly. And I see now is uh, starting to networking more and more, uh, creating uh, expert groups and uh, organizing, having more and more uh, deeper discussion on the topic. So um, well, my takeaway is that it is that uh, the community is growing and there is uh, more and more interest at many different levels. And this is, uh, of course, uh, an important input for, uh, for an agency to, you know, to elaborate and process it in a way to eventually and possibly support it. Uh, so that's what I can, uh, I can provide for my side. And uh, I think uh, uh, we need to continue, you researchers need to continue uh, what you are doing. There is uh, still a lot of things uh, that can be explored. I see that more we advance and discuss and more we see, um, yeah, branching in a, also different uh, research possibility that they were not envisioned before. Uh, we are already starting to discuss about uh, a new sense or even new mission, something that uh, 
three, four years ago was uh, was uh, received with laughs. So I, I really perceive uh, the flow of things that is, uh, you know, going in a very interesting direction. And uh, yeah, it's not only a uh, scientific interest, it's also uh, an interest that uh, I see more and more uh, uh, at very different level of society. Uh, now, as we know, also with the large uh, uh, United Nations ministerial initiative. So definitely is something that we need to explore, uh, especially because there is the request. Eh? So there is a demand to explore and it's also our responsibility to try to guide this effort in the best possible way in order to optimize the money and, uh, and the time. So I, I, I welcome your effort and I invite you to continue working in this direction. And uh, from my side as a representative of a funding agency, I will uh, do what I can to, to support. And thank you very much for the very nice uh, discussion today. We should actually make uh, more of this kind of discussion, I think. We never have the time to go deeper and uh, hear so many experts at the same time. Thank you very much, Paolo. We, we should not forget that uh, within the commitments of uh, what we established for the United Nations will be to try to do this type of meetings more recurrent. And uh, within the objectives of the decade of action, uh, actually we have a mandate to try to have means and tools to continue progressing and exchanging within the community. So uh, we shall hope that this is going to be uh, an initial meeting of a series of meetings, which uh, we will have chance to, to bring uh, again uh, the community from users and stakeholders that are interested in, in bringing remote sensing technologies so we can continue to learn from them and also to present uh, what are the evolution uh, of the remote sensing techniques and how they can cope with those with all this. And finally, to uh, determine what are the needs uh, that we have as a remote sensing community to continue improving and achieving the uh, needs and objectives from those end users and societal partners, which at the end are the ones who can put in place the, the, the real measurements, the, the real changes uh, and actions to really achieve uh, this objective of a clean ocean by 2030. And uh, with this statement, I think uh, it's uh, the time to thank you, all of you, for your presence, uh, for your presence during these days, for all your presentations, your uh, very active participation. It has been extremely useful, everything that you have been uh, doing during these days and all the contributions that we have received. I thank you very much. Be aware that the videos and the padlets uh, that we have been sharing during these days are going to be available. Uh, there is already some information in the chat uh, for, for you to follow up on this. So the videos will be there. And we welcome, for sure, out of all of you, uh, uh, any kind of comments, uh, additional inputs that you want to do, contributions. If any person from the audience is, is willing to, 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 to add to the mass of the decadal action, Feel free to reach out and, uh, and contact us. Uh, we are reachable through the IOCCD Task Force for Remote Sensing of Marine Debris and, and Plastic Litter, but uh, you can also, of course, uh, discuss uh, directly with any of the participants and our panelists, which they will be more than happy to, to help you to, 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 to be part of this, of this movement. And uh, finally, I want to thank you also to the organization of the, of the IT aspects uh, of this, uh, of this uh, satellite activity that uh, has been possible thanks to, to Air Center, which very kindly has provided all the means, technical means and personnel to, to make this happen. And uh, I must say it has been an awesome work and um, they have done a lot of effort on this. And uh, we have been uh, very fortunate to be able to enjoy uh, these two days of discussions with a seamless interface, uh, which is always quite a challenge with a large number of participants. So thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we will see you in the coming uh, months, uh, whereas by your direct contact to us or in the next events that we will organize. So please stay tuned and please stay connected.